bespoke radio for the masses. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. If the game is rigged, change the game. Game changer. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. This is Fade to Black with your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. I need your help to get to the year 1985. To Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I. Okay, I'll get. I'll put my serious hat on. Fade to Black. Bespoke radio for the masses. Today's Monday, June 20th. 172 days into the new year, 194 days left. We are live from a bunker somewhere in downtown Burbank, California. And I would like to welcome everybody listening all around the world, all across the United States, hither and thither, to and fro, back and forth, up and down, east and west, north and south, far and near. This is Fade to Black for KJCR, the Game Changer Network, and KGRA, the planet. I'm your also humble host, Jimmy Church. What's going on, everybody? I hope everybody had a fun, safe Father's Day weekend. We did. Had the family over. Twice, by the way. We did two dinners yesterday. <laughs> Yeah, we did. We really did. And I hope that uh, everybody just had a fun, safe Father's Day weekend. It was the gates of hell here in Southern California over the weekend. And the warning was, and it was coming because Friday, um, I'm with my daughter, Deanna and Rita, around the back patio, and we're enjoying a, a beautiful night outside on Friday night. It was, you know, like... Low 60s, mid 60s, you know, just, you know, nine o'clock at night, just a beautiful night. And uh, I said, man, this is perfect. We need to have some people over this weekend. It's Father's Day, right? Deanna goes, well, it's uh, it's going to be 105. <laughs> I said, when? Uh, it's going to start tomorrow and then, uh, you know, Sunday. And, and it's supposed to be even hotter on Monday. Hotter than 105. <laughs> Man, and it did. It got got way over 105 yesterday. I think it was 109, and then uh, 110 today. Maybe even warmer. And we were when you're out in the high desert, like we were in Joshua Tree two weeks ago, and it's hot, right? And I got to tell you, uh, <laughs> the desert wasn't that bad. We had a uh, family over yesterday uh, that uh, uh, was in Palm Springs for the weekend, and they came over last night for dinner number two for Father's Day. And they said it was 120 in Palm Springs. And they left the house at about 10 o'clock, 1030, something like that, 11 o'clock. And, and I turned on the local news, and they were giving the current... <laughs> The current temperatures as of 11 o'clock, and it was 107 in Palm Springs at 11 o'clock last night. So that's what's going on here. And I realize that the rest of the country is nice and balmy and everything, but uh, uh, so enjoy it. Don't rub it in. It, it's one of those rare occasions that we're jealous of the weather around the country in Southern California right now. We are jealous of what you guys have out there because it is miserable here right now okay enough of that it's uh it's beautiful here 90 95 percent of the time uh but you know that five percent where we do this little uh two-week run in southern california you know of a buck five buck ten it's here and it's for real it is hot 
Tonight, we have, uh, not only tonight, but we have an amazing week lined up here on Fade to Black. Tonight, Mike Bear is going to be here. And Mike hasn't joined us in a while. And tonight, we're going to discuss uh, NASA and the secret space program. And one of the things about Mike, uh, one, you know, he's a guest on the show often, but number two, he's a neighbor and we hang out a lot and we do a lot of things together out there, uh, TV shows and and uh, conventions and conferences and stuff like that. So, you know, it's just one of those things where, you know, we hang out so much that we probably missed a few opportunities to have him back on the show. And it's been a while, and I didn't realize it had been that long. So tonight, Mike Barra is with us, but check this out. Tomorrow night, William Henry is going to be here to talk about the ascension of Mary Magdalene and this breaking news out of the Vatican. And we're going to discuss that tomorrow night. And then Wednesday, the one and only Nick Redfern is going to be here, and we're going to discuss his new book, Women in Black, WIBs. Women in Black, and that is Wednesday night. Then Thursday night, very special presentation with director of Zeitgeist and the Zeitgeist Films, Peter Joseph, is going to be here. Now, we had Peter scheduled uh, a month ago, and uh, there was some stuff that went down, and we had to reschedule, but that's going to happen on Thursday. And don't worry, John Rappaport's going to be here for his No More Fake Newsroom. And then Peter Joseph's going to be here. So that's going to be a very spree, uh, very special presentation on Thursday night. Now, that is a solid week here on Fade to Black. Tonight, the phone number to call in is 323-825-5045. And I was, you know, I was sitting here contemplating today as I was, uh, as I was working on the show and prepping uh, with Rita. I was, I was just sitting here thinking. We're at, tonight is the show number 475, 475, closing in on three years of paranormal on the air. Not three years on the air. We've been on the air for a long time, but three years closing in on three years, 475 shows. And I'm looking at this guest list that we have scheduled for this week and thinking about what went down last week and the week before and the week before there there's only a few uh places in in the world where you can go for this like this and and that's it there's only you know fade to black has risen to the very top the very top and it's it's been a crazy it's like we were shot out of a cannon I can't even explain this this ride that we have gone on. But just look what we have done. And we're going to have a, our three-year anniversary very soon. We're going to crack 500 shows. 500. Not 100. You know, and if you think about how long it would take, if you have a, if you have a, a TV show that airs once a week to get to 500, 10 years, right? It's like that. Think about that. You know, and for us to sit here tonight at 475 shows and, and almost three years, nobody else does this. Nobody. And we have the very best guests. We have the very best audience. We have the very best sponsors. And what a ride it has been. And I just sat back today and and just kind of reminisced and thought back. And I went through, I was, uh, you know, doing some production work today uh, with the staff here. And, and, and I was looking at the previous shows and, and just going back and looking, man, it seems like forever ago, but we pulled this off in such a short time and, and where things are going is just as exciting as well. And so I do. And after coming off a of father's day weekend and spending it with family, this is an opportunity for me to say to you, the audience, thank you. Uh, n none of this is possible. None of it without you. And I, if I could sit and thank each and every one of you personally, I would. And I just, I, I really mean it. Just thank you. It is such a humbling experience. All right, let's go.
Uh, now that I got the mushy stuff out of the way, I'm feeling all fuzzy. Twitter, at J Church Radio, is what you want to do. Follow us on Twitter, at J Church Radio. Hashtag F2B is the sandbox. There are a lot of listeners tonight that are brand new to the show tonight. And that's what you want to do. Okay? F2B, hashtag F2B is the sandbox. And if you don't already have it, go right now. Go to Twitter, download TweetDeck. Get that out of the way. Get TweetDeck on your system. If you don't have TweetDeck right now, get it while I'm speaking to you. Get it downloaded. Open it up. Use uh, When you start your columns, get one column going that is hashtag F2B. It will load automatically, and you have a, a brand new Twitter world in front of you. If you have any issues, just hashtag F2B and come into the sandbox and say, hey, I want to be a fade or not. I want to figure this stuff out. Can somebody here help me? There is an entire room full of people that will come and rescue you and get you going. And this is an interactive show. Yes, we have email. Yes, we have chat rooms and we have Twitter. Everything is run and monitored and flows right with this show. Okay? So if you have any questions, any comments, anything that you want to do, you can do it all in real time. Plenty of people to talk to. Nobody here is rude, and if anybody attempts to get rude, they will find out that nobody will react to them, <laughs> and they leave. All right. Any questions or comments, use hashtag F2BQ. That's what you want to do. Let's see. Walter just sent in. He said, since the moon is full, perhaps the moon and the mystery should be covered tonight with Barra. Possibly. Um Tonight, what's what's the occurrence? It's a full moon, and and what's the uh, is today the solstice? Today's the longest day of the year, right? Yeah, that's a pretty unique. Uh, it's like once every how many years? Hundred or something? I had read earlier today something crazy, sixty-seven years. Pretty amazing. I right, where am I? Life change tea is where I am. Life change tea. Everybody around here. The team, the staff, the family, everybody is on the Life Change Tea program. And you can change your life, too. Just go to GetTheTea.com. Go to Jimmy Church Radio. Click on the banner. Go to the specials page. Pick something out. It's all good. Colostrum LD. Everything is good. Moringa. Everything there is great. One of the best companies in the world. All right? Use promo code Jimmy, J-I-M-M-Y, change your life. You can use that over the phone or when you check out and complete your order online. Also, Studio Dome, yes, their TWS, true wireless stereo, hi-fi, Bluetooth system, two speakers, $129 in a heart shell case. The promo code is JCRTWS. You can just go to the website. It's right there. Look on the banner. There's the promo code. Use that when you check out because you're going to get it for $129, 60% off the normal price of $399, and you get free shipping. And that is just for the Fader Knots. So that is positively the best deal anywhere on the Internet. Uh, next week, we head out the Roswell Festival, June 30th through July 3rd in Roswell, New Mexico. Travis Walton, Don Schmidt, Tom Carey, uh, Daryl Sims. It's going to be a huge event. Clyde Lewis is going to be there. We're going to broadcast Friday night from the Roswell Museum. And I think you're going to want to hang out. And if you want to be part of the Fade 2 Black team and get yourself a real, authentic Fade 2 Black crew t-shirt, and trust me, those are rare, and you have to earn your stripes, email Rita at jimmychurchradio.com right now. You can also go to the contact page and and contact Rita through there. Right after that, the Awareness Life Expo, Crown Plaza Hotel, August 12th, 13th, and 14th, Crown Plaza, Sacramento, California. Friday night is a private event, VIP Mixer, and we will be broadcasting Fade to Black from that private party. I know you want to go. That's Friday night, Crown Plaza Hotel. Richard Dolan, Lori McDonald, Victor Camacho, Patty Greer, Holly Cook, Len Caston, and and many others. All right. And there all the links for everything that we're going to be doing 
or over at jimmychurchradio.com. Let's get the show cracking. Today, Michael Anthony is 62 years old. Man, he should have been the lead singer in Van Halen, if you think about it. He was the best singer in the band. Not the best front man, just the best singer. Michael Anthony, 62. Lionel Richie is 67. Unbelievable. I wonder if he knew that his daughter would make him famous a second time around. John Goodman today is 64. Rita and I were watching uh, Raising Arizona again (laughs) over the weekend. John Goodman today, 64. Brian Wilson, one of the greats all time of the Beach Boys today is 74. Duran Duran bassist John Taylor is 56. Chino Marino of the Deftones is 43. Twiggy Ramirez of Marilyn Manson is 45. And the director, Robert Rodriguez, is 48. You know, he did Desperado, Machete, Sin City, did the Grindhouse flicks from dusk till dawn. One of our favorites here at Fade to Black, Robert Rodriguez. And if you are an aspiring filmmaker, go and watch his video series on how to be a director. (laughs) Yeah, go and watch it. And that's all I'm going to say. All right. On this day in history, 1975, Jaws, directed by Steven Spielberg, literally made millions of people afraid to go in the water. It opened in theaters on this day in 1975. I know I've told the story before, but it's true. I was uh, up at my Aunt Carolyn's house in Michigan that summer. Spent the summer up there with her and my Uncle Al. And they had a, a pool in the backyard, in-ground pool. He was a, a construction, uh, he had a construction company up there. And, uh, and we go see Jaws. Loved it. And that summer... I was in her pool every day. I'd wake up first thing in the morning before I ate breakfast, shorts on, out, diving board, swimming. Man, that was my thing every single day Then for like a month. Then we went to go see Jaws. And the next day I wake up, habit, you know, and I'm like, you know, 1975, so I'm 11 years old, right? 11, 12 years old. And I wake up, throw on the shorts run out, got my beach towel, run out to the pool, went right up to the diving board and dived in. And then I remembered Jaws while I was under the water and I was swimming. And I remember, I mean, I had a heart attack. I'm 12 years old, have a heart attack under the water. And you know, the underwater lights that light up the pool, you know, looks like a car headlight. And I know that that was right next to the ladder to get out of the pool, and I can see it. And, I mean, I'm just. (laughs) And I don't even think I climbed the ladder. I think I levitated out of the pool and sat there hyperventilating. And my Aunt Carolyn comes out, and she goes, why aren't you swimming? And I'm like, I'm good. What's for breakfast? (laughs) I didn't get in the pool for the rest of the summer. Tonight, we have very special guest Mike Barra is with us. I've got Starbucks in front of me, by the way, and I'm going to sip my Starbucks out of a Starbucks cup that I'm doing right here, courtesy of my daughter. Vente. French roast. And did you know, this is a fader fact, did you know that there is a Starbucks coffee cup in every scene of Fight Club. That's right. That, my friends, is a fader fact. Tomorrow night, William Henry is here. We're going to be talking about the ascension of Mary Magdalene. Wednesday night, Nick Redfern is going to be here. We're going to talk about women in black. Thursday night, very, very special presentation with director of the Zeitgeist Films, Peter Joseph, is going to be here. And that is right after John Rappaport and his No More Fake Newsroom. How is that for a week? I'm fade to black. I'm ready. I don't know what happened the other day, by the way, but uh, yesterday uh, with the heat, ah, did something to my back right between my shoulder blades. Man, ooh, ah, yeah, ah. 
heavy drugs are in my future. Oh, man. It's hard to breathe. It is. It's hard for me to breathe. <gasps> when I do that, I can't breathe. My the, my ribs on the back half of my body feel like they're poking into my lungs. Oh, man. Anybody got any tips on what to do about this? It's It's just crazy. I've been stretching. Nothing. Nothing helps. I didn't do any drugs last night, though. Maybe I should have. All right. So in the wake of uh, this Orlando uh, tragedy, and there's no other way to describe it, the tragedies, actually, that went down in Orlando, um, a lot of stuff has been posted, you know, around the web. I'm getting emails on it and getting this and that and Facebook and and you start clicking through and start looking at this, and you start to see something that I complain about a lot, which which is, quite frankly, the fake news sites. And I was, I was, man, I was going and, and reading these headlines and, and clicking, just thinking, knowing before I click that it's, that it's bogus. But I, I just went to see how far some of these fake news sites would take things. And uh, what is ironic, the definition of irony, actually, and um, uh, synchronicity is right before the show, somebody posted something about one of these fake news sites. I'm not going to say the name because I don't want them to get clicks and, and you know, that's just going to uh, let them know that they're doing, you know, something right to make money and it and it's not right but i go to one of these fake news sites click on it uh because of the headline and the headline was interesting i mean the headline was something that made me raise an eyebrow about the orlando shooter and i just thought well maybe this is some and then it just turned out to be one of these bogus sites but on this site and i'm not kidding one of the headlines read and i'm not making this up Muslims gang rape four-year-old girl in Idaho. Something like that. I'm paraphrasing. And uh, Muslim immigrants or something. And I just thought, how low can you go? How low? Not only do you... Now, think about this for a second. Not only do you have to think up this headline... That you're going to put in boldface type, that you're going to hyperlink, and that's going to be the name of your article. And if you know anything about coding and the internet, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And that's the headline that's going to read out there. So, you know, you have the brainiac that's going to think up a headline like that and then write a story to go along with it. And of, of you know it's it's, it's uh, I I I was so repulsed, and you just have to stop and take pause. That there are people out there that will make stuff up, not only for clicks, but because they think it's entertainment, and they're hoping that somebody's also going to believe it, and then later they say, ah, it's a satire site. We're just making it up. You know, that's not satire. It's wrong. <laughs> it's just wrong. And it doesn't even have to say it was Muslims this week because of what happened in Orlando. Any other week, insert, you know, and, and that kind of stuff. And it's not cool. It's really not cool. And the, the misleading stuff that goes in, and then you go and look at some of these sites, and you look at their worldwide web ranking now and their their rankings are high i mean they're good but they're not good because people go there because it's a good site people go there because they're tricked into clicking on said link and that's where society when it uh, uh capitalism the united states love it man i'd love it you can go from being homeless to owning a house if you really want to work hard. And you can't do that anywhere else. You can go from homeless to college if you choose to. 
You don't have to. You don't want to. You don't have to. You Okay. But here, that's the, you know, it's one of the great things about this country. And then the foul part about this country is that people think that this is a cool way to make money. They really do. And the misleading websites and causing the clicks and the click throughs and then to get a web ranking. And, and then obviously they're selling ads, same ads on, you know, there's, there's got to be probably out of the top 150,000 sites in the United States, 150,000. You would think that that would be 150,000 legitimate companies that have their own websites and they're all, you know, in a ranking there. No, huh? no, 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 no. Some of these top websites, you go, and I'll make something up. I'll, I'll, I'll just make it up right now. But it'll be like uh, clickforcash.com, you know, the little sub-site. You know, something like that. Adsclick.com. And those are the sites where you're going to go and click, and boom, they steer you to this. And you go, and you go to click on that headline, and that takes you to an advertiser. And, then, and it's all for clicks and money. Clicks and money. Clicks and money. And the more visitors to the site, no matter how they got there, the higher ranking that you have. And that is what bothers me, that there is no moral police for that. I have no idea how much money these websites make, but I guarantee you it's, it's a lot of cash for something that is virtual. And, and they make up these headlines to draw you in. For bogus, it's it's satire. It's not real. And isn't that amazing? It, 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 just imagine if those headlines were on something mainstream or your local news, you know, to lure you in. Muslims rape four-year-old, gang rape four-year-old girl. What? And you're going to watch the news that night. Then you get there and you find out that it's a fake story. Is that cool? No. Oh, but we got the number one news program in the world. No. It's uncool. And it's the same thing with these sites. You know, I'm not for bigger government or anything, but there are sometimes regulation needs to come into play here. Yeah. So anyway, enough of that. Tonight, Mike Barra is here. You know, I'm not the most, I'm not the moral police. I'm not the moral police with anybody. And I've certainly had my issues in the past. I have them today. But man, you know, I think we should draw the line. Anonymous has started a, a new political party, by the way. I've got that news for you after the break. It's pretty interesting. And they want to be your moral police now. It's pretty cool. Well, no, it's not pretty cool. It's pretty different. I got that for you right after the break tonight. Mike Barra. I'm your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Network and KGRA, The Planet. I'll be right back. You're listening to Jimmy Church, Fade to Black. Fade to Black will now pause for alien identification. The station that talks the net. KGRA Radio. What's up, revolutionaries? It's me, Jimmy Church. Do you have an IRS or state tax issue? Well, I did, and I called national tax experts. My problems were fixed, done, fini, and man, I got to tell you, it was a relief. National tax experts are a recognized tax office that services clients in all 50 states. It doesn't matter where you live. Give them a call. I'm telling you, they take the time to understand each and every client's individual financial status as well as their financial goals. And that's exactly what you need, my brother, when you're taking on the evil three letter. So, seriously. Give them a call today at 1-877-909-5444. Again, 1-877-909-5444. Or go check out their website, www.nattaxexperts.com. That's N-A-T-T-A-X-E-X-P-E-R-T-S.com. Tell them Jimmy sent you.
Hi, folks. Ronnie here reminding you that June is Health Awareness Month, sponsored by Get the Tea. Com. Many of you have heard our tea commercial, maybe visited the website, but haven't committed because, well, you just don't know. Skeptical. We understand. Just to remind you, our tea is not just tea. In fact, very little tea. Life Change Tea is a unique blend of eight different herbs, removing intruders that attack your health. You brew our tea to make the concentrate, you add water, and put in the fridge. Two eight-ounce glasses a day, and life will be good. Visit us at GetTheTea.com. That's GetTheTea.com. And this month is lots of fun stuff with Health Awareness Month. You could be picked and receive your order absolutely free. You never know. Read the testimonies and try our products. Log on to GetTheTea.com. That's GetTheTea.com. And for great health tips, visit my YouTube channel at Health Matters Now, where you can learn about health tips and how products work on your body. Join me, GetTheTea.com. Nine out of ten geneticists agree. Fade to Black is not your father's radio show. On the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the planet. Hi, this is Chase Kletsky with Fate Magazine Radio, and you're listening to Jimmy Church and Fade to Black on the Game Changer Network and the KGRA digital broadcast station, where the Fader Knots rock. Hi, this is Rob Reiner from Anvil, and you're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. What's up? I'm Chris. What up? This Mass is Kyle and you're listening, listening to Jimmy Church Radio. All right, welcome back, Fade to Black. It's Monday, kicking off a great week. Tonight, Mike Bear is with us. Tomorrow night, William Henry. Wednesday night, Nick Redfern. Thursday night, Peter Josephs is going to be here. Also, John Rappaport and his No More Fake Newsroom. Now, check this out. Anons throughout the world united together to form a first-of-its-kind anonymous political party. It's named the Humanity Party. Their website, humanityparty.com. They are calling it by their acronym, THUMP. The Humanity Party, THUMP. The Humanity Party has released a short video introduction by its voice of Anonymous, along with a 30-minute documentary called the way to world peace, imagine, defining the ideology behind Thump's movement. And in March of 2015, various Anons discreetly met to vote on a board of directors to lead the movement. The board appointed one of its Anons as its voice of Anonymous. The Humanity Party bases its movement on three key concepts. One, Establish and promote the possibility of a one world government and a new constitution that guarantees and provides worldwide basic human rights to all people of Earth. The five basic necessities of life, the FBN, the FBNL, that's what they're calling it, are free, healthy food and water, secure and safe housing, basic clothing, health and mental care and education. Number two, introduce a plan to unify capitalistic and socialistic agendas and ideologies to provide the FBNL free of charge. Number three, to promote peace and unity through education and common sense disclosures, thereby providing unprecedented evidence that the world's major religions have been, are, and will continue to be the cause of the world's social ills. Wow. That's for, for, for now, all I've got is wow. And that's official. That's from Anonymous. All right, Mike Barra. You know, now, Mike hasn't been on with this for, man, I don't know, about, it, it's been, it's been a while. I didn't actually go and check, but I'm thinking, could it have been a year? He's been on the show here and there a few times, but full show, it's been a while. 
but he is a New York Times bestselling author. He's a lecturer, TV personality. He began his writing career after spending more than 25 years as an engineering consultant for ma major aerospace companies where he was a card-carrying member of the military-industrial complex. A self-described born-again conspiracy theorist, Mike's first book, Dark Mission, The Secret History of NASA, which was co-authored with Hoagie, was a New York Times bestseller in 2007. His second book, The Choice, was published in 2010. 2012, he published Ancient Aliens on the Moon from Adventures Unlimited Press. And then in 2013, he returned with Ancient Aliens on Mars. Of course, his current book is Ancient Aliens and Secret Societies. And he is a regular contributor to Ancient Aliens and America's Book of Secrets. His website is Mike Barra. Dot blogspot.com. I'd like to welcome back our good friend, Mike Bear. Mike, good evening. Hey, Jimmy. How are you? I'm doing good, my brother. Everything good with you? Yeah, I'm just sitting here on Yannette Garcia's Instagram enjoying myself, so I'm, I'm having a good night. Ah, uh, <laughs> man, why? You just got to go there. <laughs> well, she's a Mexican weather girl. Come on. Uh, okay, I, okay. I, like to, I like to watch the weather reports in Spanish. I man, mean, you know, uh, hey. You, you don't even know what she's saying. You probably watch. It's hot. She's saying caliente. It's yeah, hot. Yeah. Okay, it's hot everywhere right now. You watch Studio Dose too, don't you? Uh, no, but I I may check that out now that you. Okay. It, so. <laughs> All right. Now, um, Mike, uh, there there's a lot to discuss tonight. There's a lot of things going on right now, Great. and now before we jump in feet first, um, what are you doing now? I know that you've got some stuff going on with Gaia. Right. Yeah. Well, right now I'm actually trying to get out of the speeding ticket I got this morning for doing 80 and a 60. So uh, call me Speed Racer tonight, Jimmy. I want to be referred to as as SR Speed Racer okay. for that one. Uh, fair, um, fair enough. Uh, yeah, I'm doing. Uh, I'm, I'm actually wrote some episodes of a new uh, series for Gaia called going to be called Deep Space, and it's going to be about the secret space program. And it it kind of um, I'm also going to be appearing in that. So I got. Um, you know, I did, did an interview at Contact in the Desert and uh, with, with the guys from Gaia. And so I'm interested to see how that comes out. And it kind of ended up being some research for a new book that I'm going to do starting tomorrow. <laughs> I'm going to start writing it tomorrow. Okay. All right. Well, uh, we'll give you some stuff to write about tonight. Yeah. And my diet. I'm starting a diet tomorrow also. So. <laughs> okay. I don't know about Speed Racer, but Chim Chim. We, Chim Chim? We, yeah, oh, okay. We, we, right. we can go with that. It's better than Trixie. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Although Trixie was pretty cool. Trixie was pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. By the way, I, I just wanted to say before we get – speaking of heat, I, I got the nicest letter from Victoria at Contact in the Desert today, and it was really great. And I just – you know, we haven't had time to really talk about that. I'm sure you talked about it on the show. But what a, what a wonderful experience again, in, in spite of the fact that I almost died on Saturday. But it was uh, – I just wanted to say what a wonderful conference it was and how – great it was to see everybody there yeah it was pretty cool it was pretty cool and we'll even talk about uh the, the sightings and uh mm. yeah that was uh pretty interesting too as well and yeah I, it was kind of funny because i was i hadn't started drinking yet when you and i and 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 <laughs> dolan started talking about you know what what i well, saw I thought, I thought you were gonna say i hadn't started drinking yet because it was 7 30 in the morning but, you know, you know. right 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 well that too but but you and i almost went toe to toe in front of everybody discussing what i saw and you know what was interesting about that was you are normally uh on the defensive with me because i'm here to bust your chops right right well and, oh yeah or something else yeah yeah and, and that was an opportunity finally for you to come back at me and i came back at you with dude put it in check man you were not you, there you, uh, you always get hurt by things i don't remember <laughs> so I, I don't remember busting your chops maybe i'd had a few at that point yeah too. yeah well and we'll discuss that because contact right, in the right. desert was uh it was an extraordinary weekend uh for everybody even though you went down for the count you did you did make it back to nori's party and and you did do your uh, workshop that night, so yeah. you, you landed on your feet. I don't want to, yeah. you know. The rumors were for everybody out there that it, it it's kind of funny. It's like that game telephone, right? Mike, right. Mike went from not feeling so well to the rumors went around contact in the desert that he had collapsed, was taken away on a on a stretcher to an ambulance. Yeah, open <laughs> heart surgery. You know, 
in front of everybody and and it turned out of, of course not to be the case and and you were you turned out to be okay so let's let's make that clear it was good even though uh, mike was supposed to be part of my panel that afternoon mm-hmm. and and i i called mike on the phone i said can you do it and he said yeah i'm gonna i said look don't do it because of me and then you come up you know on the stage and collapse again and give me that guilt so yeah yeah you, well you're my bro i was gonna try to make it happen for you but i just i just think it was better that i stayed in bed a little bit longer that day it was a rough day yeah so we we had the uh, empty chair uh up on the stage <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that was pretty cool okay so anyway uh we're gonna get to the sightings here in a minute i want to i really really want to discuss the secret space program and last month we did a series on the secret space program and the response uh was overwhelming this is something that everybody is talking about today we know that there's something going on so i'm going to start right there mike is there a secret space program that nasa is involved in i think there is but I think there are two secret space programs. So to answer your specific question, yeah, NASA is involved in one of them. I think there's another parallel one that exists. So I think we really have three space programs, one public and two secret. That's what I think is going on. Okay, so let's start with NASA. What's going on with them? Well, what I think happened from, from doing my research and piecing it together, and this is what I'm going to put in the next book, which is going to be called Hidden Agenda, by the way, Um what I think happened is that there was this intelligence um, – the, what do they call it? The national security state. I think that's Dolan's term. And um, kind of was created after the Roswell crash in 47 and kind of went its own way. It was actually – actually, it was it – was, the president was part of – in the loop and everything. It was part of all this stuff until about 1960 when Kennedy came along. And then it appears that that he was cut out of what was going on with MJ-12, you know, the Majestic 12 operation and and all that stuff. And so I think what Kennedy did and the reason why he was motivated to go to the moon was that he decided, well, you know, F you guys, um, I don't care what you know, I'm going to start my own space program. We're going to go to the moon. We're going to retrieve the technology that we all know is left there by the aliens, whether it's, you know, the Anunnaki or whatever. We're going to bring it back here and we're going to reverse engineer it ourselves. So I think there was a secret space program that went silent about 1958. And then I think Kennedy, when he couldn't make any headway with them, when he got into office, started his own separate Apollo program to go to the moon, retrieve the technology and develop their own secret space stuff uh, high technology stuff on the side. So that's what I think's been happening. And I think that's where NASA's involvement uh, starts. Now, did Kennedy know about the secret space program? Yeah, Kennedy clearly, I think, knew that there was something going on behind the scenes. I mean, one of the first things he did was inquire about this stuff. And, and you know, people have always wondered what's Kennedy's motivation for going to the moon and starting the Apollo program. And I, I think it was that he ran into a to a stone wall when he tried to find out what was going on with governments and aliens, because I think Kennedy had actually had a UFO sighting in the in the 40s or 50s that he reported. And um, as you get through and look at the documents, there's this very famous document called the Burn Memo, which is part of the Majestic 12 documents, where they basically say that you know, as you know, Lancer has been inquiring about our activities, which we cannot allow. Now, Lancer is was JFK's. So um, Secret Service code name. So what that means is that they were definitely planning on cutting uh, John F. Kennedy out of the loop. I think he was the first president to be cut out of the loop. And, and um, so he started his own response to that, which is to use NASA to go retrieve the technology that he needed to start his own good guys secret space program, I guess. So what you're suggesting, which sounds reasonable actually is that kennedy knew that this was going to happen and there's a space race that's going on with russia obviously we were knee deep in the the cold war neck deep Mm -hmm. at that that point and and russia by all accounts was kicking our butts uh, uh on all fronts not only with satellites but you know the first man in space allegedly First, right. The first woman in space, allegedly. The first woman in space that the Soviets did in 1963, 
her time in space, which was 71 hours, right, Mm -hmm. was more than all of our astronauts combined up until that point. So, right. You know, I mean, and and that's the stuff that's in the public. Whether it actually happened or not, that's beside the point. It's what the public knows and reads, right? Yeah. So so if Kennedy knows about this uh, space program that's going on and they are going to go to the moon and they're going to do what they have to do, well, possible to maybe use that technology or use that story to get to the moon before the Russians with a man and and he could ride that technology wave would that make sense yeah i think to me that does make sense and i think that's exactly what happened because um you know kennedy was somebody who who didn't really show that much interest in space until he got into office and here's here's what i think happened i think that that around 58 you know the the secret government the secret space program guys who may or may not have been associated with the nazis basically took their stuff, they took their toys and they went home. And when Kennedy tried to dig into that, he got stonewalled. And I think Von Braun went to him and said, if you will put, uh, you know, men on the moon and, and give me the glory in essence, I will help you with secret space technology. And because Von Braun, as soon as Explorer One, which is our first satellite was launched, in 1958, von Braun figured out that there was something wrong with our understanding of physics and gravitation. And he started inquiring of all these experiments that had been done by other researchers, especially uh, Jacques Allais, who was researching something called the Allais effect back in the 1950s, where he had free swinging pendulums that were, you know, normally a pendulum, free swinging pendulum will, will rotate with, will, with, it'll spin with the rotation of the Earth. But what he found is that during a total eclipse over Europe, the pendulum actually began to rotate backwards against the rotation of the Earth very, very rapidly. And there was no way to account for this effect in any of the physics uh, textbooks, and there still isn't. And the effect has been repeated numerous times by numerous experimenters. And I think it it tipped von Braun off that there was something going on with um, potential propulsion using this technology. So because what happened with Explorer 1 is it ended up in an orbit that was about 600 miles higher than it was supposed to be. That's right. Um, about two, you know, about a, it was about a 33% uh, increase over what they expected the orbit to be. And um, they never, you know, they, they, then they did all these other experiments where they were putting, were putting rockets up and they kept ending up in orbits that were way too high. And they tried to go to the moon and they actually overshot the moon. The first time we tried to actually hit the moon with a, with a, a space probe, it was a Mariner series, I believe. Uh, they missed it by 38,000 miles. That's 18 times the diameter of the moon itself. And, and it's basically, Jimmy, that's impossible. I mean, once you get something up in, in orbit, there's very, very little gravity. There's absolutely no air, of atmosphere of any kind to restrict it. It's a, it's a straight shot. It's a ballistic shot. I mean, basically, you know the moon is moving. It's like hitting a moving target in a shooting range. Right. You know, you know where the target's going to be when the bullet gets there. You pull the trigger, and it should hit the target every time. And we missed it by 18 times the actual diameter of the moon. And the moon is not small. It's 2,160 miles across. So von Braun knew there was something going on. And I think he went to Kennedy and said, look, if you do a public space program and put men on the moon and make me a hero and I'll be the engineer behind it, I'll get you there, I'll help you research the technology or whatever it is that we find there. I think they made a, um, a deal behind the scenes. And, and don't forget either that um, – Kennedy had proposed on on three different occasions before he was killed that we go to the moon with the Russians, that we join with the Russians to get there faster and more efficiently. And on the third try in 1963, in November of 63, Khrushchev had said yes. And I think that's what got Kennedy killed a couple of days later, 10 days later. Well, okay, two points. That's a, it's a little off the, off the question. No, that's- it's not. It's exactly on the question. So let's stay with us for a second. Two points. Number one. Why were the calculations off that we were putting stuff, you know, 400 miles further out? You know, was that a gravitational issue? If you remember, uh, and I want to stay on that first part of the question. The second one is how in the hell did we miss the moon by 38,000 miles? But the first question is, you remember Von Braun came up with those crazy calculations that we were going to need a rocket the size of the Empire State Building or something nuts, right? And, right. In, in order to get to the moon. And and so were they just over-calculating, making things, uh, uh, you, you know what I mean, uh, uh, stronger, faster, better 
when they didn't really need to? Why were we overshooting these orbits by 400 miles? Okay, because, and this is this all stems from actually originally from Richard C. Hoagland's work on the monuments of Mars that we also talked about in Dark Mission, and I talked about in my book, The Choice. It has to do with what you what, what I call hyperdimensional physics, what Hoagie dubbed hyperdimensional physics. And basically what it means is that the way to generate energy from outside this universe, to bring energy down from the fifth and sixth and seventh and eighth spatial dimension is to rotate stuff. And these spacecraft, these rockets, all had significantly massive rotating systems on them. And that put extra energy into the rockets that was not accounted for in the rocket equation. And that's why they ended up overshooting their targets, missing the moon by 38,000 miles and ending up in orbits that were way too high. Because until he was able to empirically account for that um, modification of, of the rocket equation, we we had no hope of ever getting anywhere. We had no hope of making a rendezvous in space with another spacecraft. We had no hope of getting to the moon and back. And that's why he had to build this enormous, gigantic rocket. The only way to get there and have some hope of getting there and getting back was to not do any Earth orbit rendezvous or lunar, lunar orbit rendezvous, but basically just send a big rocket straight to the moon and then bring it straight back. That, however, wouldn't have worked either because, again, he wasn't accounting for the rotation what, in the gyros and various things yeah, like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. What's a rotating uh, mechanism? Well, for instance, on Explorer 1, the third stage, they had, they had solid rocket boosters. I think they had about um, – I think they had eight or ten solid rocket boosters. And at the time – the way, you know, solid rocket fuel basically is like asphalt or kind of a gum that you put um, inside of a solid rocket of a, of a tube and then you ignite it. But at that time, we weren't really very good at building the fuel cells properly. So what happened was is that they burned unevenly. So in order to, to account for that and equalize the burn rate amongst all the rockets, what they did is they rotated the third stage at 750 RPM. And you can actually see Explorer 1 on the pad before it launches, and that third stage is just spinning like a bat out of hell. And that actually gated or pulled down energy from a higher dimension and made the spacecraft go up way faster, higher, and farther than it was supposed to. So that's you know, there's all kinds of experiments. If, if the audience wants to go look up the work of Dr. Bruce De Palma, who was the brother of the film director, Brian De Palma. He did all kinds of incredible research papers on rotation. Most of it's mentioned in Dark Mission and The Choice, but if you want to go look it up yourself, you can look up De Palma's work. Um, Nikolai Kozirev did a lot of work on this stuff. So I always basically, thought, I always thought, you know, I always thought that was like rifling in a barrel, that that would help the tra trajectory. Well, the thing is, is that what we weren't accounting for in our navigational equations is the fact that we were going way faster. There's more energy in the entire system than was accounted for. So we kept missing. And, and here's the thing. And here's how we know that, that, that they figured this out. Um, there was a Ranger spacecraft. I think it was Ranger 4 that was launched. And again, the idea was you were going to launch up into orbit spin around the earth and slingshot towards the moon. And this is all calculated and figured out. But Ranger 4, the solar panels failed to deploy properly. The batteries burned out. And so all of the gyros on board stopped rotating. Guess what happened? It hit the moon. It was the first <laughs> object to hit the moon. And Von Braun must have gone, oh, my God. He might, at some point, he must have sat down and studied it and figured out, oh, my God. There's nothing rotating on it if all the batteries are dead and, and the gyros are dead. And that's why it landed on target as opposed to all the other ones, which have missed by 4,000, 10,000, 38,000 miles. I think that's when he figured it out because right after that, he went to a design review. Now, when you're in engineering, there are various stages along the development of any aircraft or spacecraft where you have a meet. You have various meetings, usually twice, three times a year, sometimes quarterly, where you take all of your design stuff to the, this big panel of engineers and you tell them what you're doing, why you're doing it, how the progress is going, all that stuff, it's called the design review. So Von Braun shows up with a design review and he has advocated direct ascent, which is what you talked about before where you got this big giant rocket that goes straight up like in the old 50s sci-fi movies, flies to the moon, turns around, fires the retros, lands on the moon, comes back all in one piece, right? right. Von Braun was adamant. That was the only way to go to the moon up until that point. But then after Ranger 4, he comes to this meeting. Everybody's expecting that he's going to say, 
no to Lunar Orbit Rendezvous. And Lunar Orbit Rendezvous is exactly what we ended up doing, where where we launch a spacecraft, we take the command and service module, you know, and the, and the lunar module to the moon, we drop the, the lunar module down, and then the lunar module, the ascent stage, launches back up and rendezvous and docks, and the guys get back in and they come home. Basically, that was impossible without the navigational problems that were solved by the spin energy stuff. So Von Braun comes to this meeting, and he actually sits down and he announces to everyone that he now supports Lunar Orbit Rendezvous over direct ascent because he knew he could never build a rocket where direct ascent would work. I mean, it might have been done eventually, but it would have been 15 or 20 years probably. And suddenly he says, I now advocate direct ascent. Well, at that time, we'd never even rendezvoused two spacecraft in orbit. But suddenly after that, we go from missing the moon by 38,000 miles to hitting the moon time after time after time accurately figuring you know figuring out the calculations and basically accomplishing all of our goals in space and so i'm positive that von braun figured out some way to account for the rotation figured it out somehow and said okay if we just add this much into the equations we'll then end up in this spot and that's how we were able to navigate the cosmos and go to the moon and come back now if von braun was our main guy which he was uh engineer yeah yeah, yeah. Who was the main guy in the military's secret space program? Hmm, that's an interesting question. Some people think that it was Hans Kammler, the Nazi um, right. uh, SS officer, who actually was in control of the German secret uh, programs that were all being all taking place in Silesia, which, by the way, it's the last place Hitler defended to the end. He defended these this uh, what 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 the allies now say is a rubber plant in Silesia. He defended that to the last breath rather than Berlin, which is kind of odd, uh, unless he had super secret weapons there. So a lot of people think it was Kammler who took all these secret technologies, the Nazi bell and all this flying saucer stuff, the repulsing, which is another thing we should talk about a little later, took all this technology, went to Argentina, eventually went to the secret Nazi base in Antarctica, and then defeated, you know, Admiral Byrd in Operation High Jump. And a lot of people think that somewhere after that, there was a an agreement made between the U.S. government, the intelligence agencies, and the Nazis to get their technology in return for, you know, granting freedom um, to all the, the Nazi war criminals. So I would think if anybody, it would be him. Well, Other than that, I can't tell you. Let's take a quick break. When we come back after the break, we're going to continue the discussion of not only the secret space program, but I'm going to get back to Hans Kammler because he is a very interesting pawn on this chessboard. I'm your host, Fade to Black, Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network and KGRA, the planet. Our guest tonight, Mike Barrett, secret space program. I'll be right back. Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. The station that talks the net. KGRA Radio. Hello, I'm Hakimi and you're listening to my main man, Jimmy Church on JimmyChurchRadio.com. Hi, this is Ray Sobs here repping the planet, and you're listening to my good friend, Jimmy Church. Fade to black on the Game Changer Network and the KGRA Digital Broadcast Station. Results may vary. Hello, I'm Jerry Mathers. I was the beaver in Leave it to Beaver. And 20 years ago, I almost died from type 2 diabetes. When I was diagnosed with type 2, I was shocked. My blood sugar was through the roof. Now, the very same natural remedies I use to control my type 2 diabetes are available for you in a super easy program called the Diabetes Solution Kit. And I should know it works. I use the very same techniques to drop 40 pounds of fat, get my blood sugar under control, and watch my type 2 diabetes fade into thin air. If you have diabetes, I urge you to try this step-by-step -step plan. It has all the natural techniques I used, and it works a lot faster, too. I'm Jerry Mathers, and if I can do it, you can do it, too. If you'd like to normalize your blood sugar and stop taking your diabetes medication completely with your doctor's approval, go to 33diabetesreverse.com. That's 33diabetesreverse.com. Reverse your diabetes in as little as 30 days by going to 33diabetesreverse.com. That's 33diabetesreverse.com now. 
Imagine no longer being tied down to your computer, but having the freedom to take live talk radio with you anywhere you go. TalkStream Live introduces our first ever iPhone application. The talk shows you follow now follow you. And your iPhone is now the fastest and easiest way to stay connected to the best talk radio on the Internet. Let TalkStream Live transform the way you listen to radio. Listen to live talk shows 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Mobile talk radio from TalkStream Live. Now available in the iTunes App Store. This is Toby Kebble. You're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. Don't hurt me, Jimmy. I'm only little. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And this is Ari Gold. We're the Honey Brothers. <laughs> We're of the Honey Brothers. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And I'm Ari Gold. We're the Honey Brothers. And you're listening to Jimmy Church. The Revolution. What's up, Fader Knots? Studio Dumb loves Fade to Black and the F2B audience so much that they have put together the ultimate stereo Bluetooth system. They've done it just for you. Man, check this out. The Studio Dome SBB2 stereo system is here. It's featuring two Studio Boombox 2 SBB2 wireless Bluetooth speakers packed in its own custom hard shell case. This Studio Dome system features the very latest in stereo Bluetooth technology. The two full-range boomboxes are in true wireless stereo. You've got to hear this. It's amazing. It's just $129, and use the promo code JCRTWS, and you'll also get free shipping. It's simple. Just go to JimmyChurchRadio.com, click on the Studio Dome banner. Go back, Lee Tappy. This is Micah Hanks of the Graylian Report, and you're listening to Jimmy Church on Fade to Black. Across the globe on the Game Changer Radio Network and the one and only KGRA Radio, The Planet. Welcome back to Fade to Black. I'm your also humble host, Jimmy Church. What's cracking? It's Monday. Mike Barra is here. We are talking about the Secret Space Program. Tomorrow night, William Henry is going to be here to talk about the ascension of Mary Magdalene. Wednesday night, Nick Redfern, Women in Black. And then Thursday night, a very special presentation with Peter Joseph. He is the director of the Zeitgeist film series, but it's about Mike Bear. Hey, Mike, uh, what did you do? You remember uh, the first time you saw the movie Zeitgeist? Uh, yeah. But before I answer that question, was that really Adrian Grenier doing a yeah a promo for? Okay, now I, I just want to say, in case he's listening, I thought that when that in Batman versus Superman, when they show all the different you know superheroes out there and they show aquaman yeah i thought it would have been so funny if they had cast grenier in that part instead. yeah right, right i mean come on yeah that what, was what were they thinking on that one yeah that was a good run that season of yeah. uh of entourage yeah yeah <laughs> that, i actually i just watched good. entourage I, I watched the whole thing all the way through plus the movie i really enjoyed it so yeah yeah the movie yeah. was not that bad actually it was no no i enjoyed it i thought no, it was, i mean uh, it was panned you know the critics hated it but if you were a fan of the rita loved it i mean she was yeah. like this you know and and you know and I, you know i've seen it a couple of times now actually the film was uh was actually pretty good. Yeah, yeah. I loved I loved uh, Russell Wilson's cameos in it. That was my favorite part, of course, because I'm yeah. a Seahawks fan. Yeah, so, yeah, 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 um, yeah. Yeah, I Zeitgeist. I think that a friend of mine <clears throat> um, actually put me onto that. Geez, about four years ago. Is that is that sound right? Was it out then? Oh um, no, it came out. This is 2016. Uh, I'm thinking. Well, there were earlier ones. Yeah, I no the original Zeitgeist. I'm thinking 2006 2007 mm. maybe yeah right okay but that. i you know i don't don't want to seem like a i'm like being a know-it-all but i kind of already knew everything they talked about in it so oh, I was, at yeah. least what i saw that hour or so that i saw so i kind of yeah well if you really saw it. so i was like I, I yeah i knew that you know so i kind of got um 
I, I wasn't, you know, I mean, I appreciate it. I think it's important to be out there. I think it's great work, but I just kind of like didn't yeah, get much from it. Yeah, but if you go back to 2007, mm -hmm. you know, the reason why, if you saw it four years ago, I mean, the film had already been out a long time, and, and a lot of this stuff was, you know, put out there in the in, in the alternative world. Yeah. Um. So, but yeah, uh, it it was just it was a really well done film, especially that first one. No, it's it's a great introduction because here's the thing, you know, every five years we're cycling in a new group of people that have never heard of any of this stuff. Jim, you know, we talk about Roswell and things just off the top of our heads, like everybody knows about them and Reynolds from Forest and the Felix Phoenix Lights, and that's not true because there are young people turning eighteen, nineteen. There you know, are girls like my friend on Facebook, Joanna, who are just getting into this stuff, and it's a great primer for them. It's a great way for them to get started and kind of like, wow, I didn't know all this stuff actually existed. So, so I, did you I, just – you just told – I mean, I'm not panning it. I'm just saying I, I kind of I, – I, I didn't finish it. Um, so you just told your, your friend, Joanna, watch this. I'm going to get you in. Uh, you I know. did. I didn't tell her that, but I, I'm going to oh, tell her. I man. name checked her. Shameless. Now, so. Mike, you are shameless. I didn't even, shameless. I didn't give her last name. So, okay. You know. Still shameless. Yeah. Okay. Hi, Joanna. Okay. Now um, <laughs> let, let's get back to Hans Kamler. It, it, Hans is a very, very, very important player mm -hmm. in this scenario. Number one. He died five times, right? <laughs> I think it was four. Actually. Yeah, four, four, Is right? Four, four officially. Anyway, yeah, yeah, right. He uh, has more deaths than Hitler. Yeah, so. death certificates, witnesses to his death. Um, <laughs> he he uh, he paraded around with his support staff, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And and was seen in multiple cities at, on multiple days. Impossible to pull off back then. And so, if you're going to get a ruse going that he's dead or alive, start these rumors, and so you can't confirm it, right? I think that right. would, it's an important thing to play into. Second, um, the, the, the Nazi bell, whatever its use was, whether it was time, it was, uh, it's it was a reactor. A weapon. I think it was, a, I think it was a, it was a, like a hyperdimensional reactor it, to, it that, could that be. generated that, Op you know, negated gravity. But anyway, that's it could be that could have opened up a portal. Stargate could be that it could be an actual time travel box. It could be that whatever it was, that was his baby. Right. Mm -hmm. And and so he had that knowledge and he was an SS officer. Let's mm -hmm. not. He was a scientist. Yes, but he was an SS officer and you don't get to be an SS officer uh, uh, by applying. So, no, it, actually, he was more of an engineer than he was a, you know, a, he wasn't a theoretical physicist. Let's put it that way. He wasn't that kind of guy, but he certainly understood how to apply technology. As was von Braun, and von Braun also was a uh, member of the SS. He was inducted into the SS. He, he was certainly a major was. He certainly in the was. SS. He certainly was. And so Kamler, though, and this is why I want to establish who he really was. He was a card-carrying officer of the SS. He mm -hmm. oversaw all of the secret programs that were going on. Hitler certainly wanted the, to uh, go over the top with something. Kamler was his boy. And, and for Kamler to, uh, somebody that was that important, to absolutely disappear is significant. And it's something that we have to take a look at because everybody else, for the most part, was accounted for, except for Hitler. And and Kamler just disappeared. Did he go to Argentina? Did he go to Antarctica? Did he end up here in the United States? Well, look, if he's dead, right? He's, mm -hmm. the, he's the perfect guy to bring into the United States and take advantage of what he knew. Not only with the, the, the Bell and that program, but everything else that he was involved in. And he could certainly head up a secret space program. Yes, he could. And I think that uh, I think it's exactly what happened. I mean, you know, uh, to me, too, Jimmy, he didn't disappear. He was disappeared. And there's a whole different uh, you know, it's a different connotation. I, I think that very clearly the simple fact that there are four official stories of how he died and they're all different um, indicates that something there were some serious shenanigans going on. I, I call shenanigans. That's all there is to it. Yeah. And he was driving around, by the way, uh, by all accounts, which one to believe, uh, it, you know, that's a whatever thing. But mm -hmm. he, he drove around with truckloads of his documents, his research and his people's.
you know, and so he had the staff with him when he disappeared and nobody right. knew a thing. And his staff, by the way, went along with him. So, yeah. you know, did he time travel? I don't know. <laughs> well, there was this there was this um, massive German plane. It had four engines on it. Um, I forget the designation of it, but it was uh, I think it was a Krupp aircraft. And uh, there were only two of them, I think, that the Germans had built. And it was capable of making these long transatlantic flights, basically from, you know, from Norway to Argentina. And, and Hitler had not only troops around this area of Silesia where the, the Nazi Bell research was done and there was this secret plant there, but he also had 250,000 troops in Norway right up until the very end. And there were supposedly some secret operations going on in Norway beyond just the, the heavy water plants that they were using to develop atomic bombs. And, you know, nobody could figure out why Hitler didn't bring those 250,000 men back to Germany because they certainly could have helped stave off the Russians a little bit and defended Berlin and, you know, maybe delayed the, the war long enough. But he kept them there. And the question is, what were they protecting? And the story is that Kammler flew to Norway, got into this plane with the bell and all of his papers and documents and scientists, like you say, and that's how he escaped to Argentina. So, you know, it, it's it's one of these things where you just you don't know exactly what happened, but you have a pretty good idea uh, what the what the story is or, or you know what happened you have a pretty good idea that he went to south america and then subsequently theoretically on to antarctica now what's the third version of the secret space program well to me um well to me it's nasa because you've got you've got this program that was started by the intelligence agencies where they invited people like t townsend brown to come and give them presentations on how to develop anti-gravity space aircraft and spacecraft and then they said thanks very much and and all of a sudden anti-gravity disappears from the the official scientific literature of the day then you've got the program that i think kennedy started and then i i think really you have nasa which is not really a secret space program but it's secret in a sense that it was a public space program but it had nefarious aims and there was a lot of again to use the word shenanigans going on with nasa and the apollo program which i've documented in in other books like Secret Societies and uh, and you know Dark Mission, so I think that really the third program was the NASA stuff, which was actually um, uh, basically a, a salvage program. It was the des designed to go and salvage Anunnaki technology from the moon and bring it back here for reverse engineering. When we stopped Apollo, uh, and when the brakes started to get pumped in 74, 73, and you started to hear rumors about it, and then all of a sudden uh, the brakes got slammed on it, did yeah. NASA, are you suggesting that NASA continued uh, 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 the secret space program, uh, not only going to the moon, but, uh, you know, other places, and 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 it never stopped? Well, no, I don't think that's true. I don't really think the Apollo 20 stories are very credible, but I do think that the technology they brought back was exploited by um, by other elements within the U.S. government, and, and probably including NASA, because the thing is, is that Kennedy would have had to keep this out of the hands of the CIA, the NSA, MJ-12, all those people that, that you know he was dealing with at the time. So um, I'm not saying that we kept going to the moon behind everybody's back. It's certainly possible, but I do think it's unlikely. Well, the funding for for NASA to, to continue outside of uh, public, uh, yeah, jurisdiction public funding yeah. would would yeah. be would be the NSA and the CIA and and the black projects for the Air Force and for the Navy, you know, and the funding well, would come in back door. I would think that that's how they would do it. I mean, there's right. No but then remember, too, that Kennedy was dead by this time. So, uh, you know, the question is, what did Johnson and Nixon ultimately know, and what did they use? Um, what did they use their the, that secret technology, that technology that was brought back? And by the way, you know, in, in Dark Mission, we've got and and an ancient aliens on the moon. I've got pictures of stuff that I think they picked up and brought back that was technology. So uh, you can actually look at pictures of the moon and see this scattered junk everywhere, this high technology stuff. So, um, you know, you don't know what Nixon and Johnson, what their aims were for the program that Kennedy had started and what was done. Maybe the two programs were merged at that point. Because I think what happened is that after Kennedy and the assassination, uh, my suspicion, and I can't prove this yet, but I'm going to work on it with, the, you know, the research for the book. I suspect that what happened was, is that they decided that they'd better tell the presidents something to keep them somewhat in the loop 
even if it was disinformation. And, and you know, you start to look at stuff like um, the Project Serpo website, and you see the the transcript of the briefing that President Reagan got in 1981, and it's it's a different story than what the MJ12 documents tell. You know, and it's almost as if they were telling them something just to satisfy his curiosity and 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 make him think that he was getting the whole story. So I, I suspect that that's the way the policy developed after after Kennedy's death. What was the technology that they were after? Uh, are you saying when you say Anunnaki, are you do you have specific um, evidence or something that points towards an ancient? you know, moon base that was there and we went and exploited it? Well, yeah. I mean, we've talked about different things on the show before about the, the ziggurat on the backside of the moon and things like that. But I think that um, even, you know, deeper than that, I think to me the the biggest, most obvious artifact in all this is, is what Hoagie called Data's head on the moon, which is this human looking head, which is clearly not a skull, though. It's, it's some sort of robot or machine. That is in a in Shorty Crater on Apollo 17, and there's a lot of other stuff in that in these images of, of Shorty Crater that appears to be mechanical debris. And if it's it's like the arm from Terminator, you know, if you bring back the arm from the Terminator and start working on it and reverse engineering it, then you're eventually going to get some ideas. You're going to figure some things out, and you're going to develop you know super secret technologies from that. So I mean, to me, those are specific specific examples of stuff that I can look at pictures and say, I think they picked that up. They could have brought it home. And if they did, um, they certainly we were advanced enough and smart enough and getting smarter all the time to figure out how they worked. What about uh, let's let's talk about moon bases. Is there an active moon base up there right now with uh, U.S. personnel? I have. No specific evidence to say yes on that one, but what's pretty clear is that there's a lot of people who think so. And there's also the fact that you've got like Gary McKinnon stuff, which talks about non-terrestrial officers. Well, if they're non-terrestrial officers w within the Defense Department working for some adjunct of NASA or some version, military version of NASA, if they're not terrestrial, where are they? They're either on space platforms or they're on bases, probably elsewhere in the solar system. And the closest place you would put a base is the moon. So if that's the case, then I think, you know, you can you can take a look at those documents and you can say, OK, there's likely something going on. But, you know, everything and I've said this repeatedly, why my book is called Ancient Aliens on the Moon is because everything that I see in the pictures that I look at that are made available to us as the public is in ruins. Everything is, you know, destroyed and has been there a very long time in terms of modern stuff. I haven't seen any pictures of that. I have said many, 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 many times that with uh, commercialized telescopes that any amateur astronomer can go and buy, uh, and now, you know, with GPS and, and computer programs built in, th they are so good, so strong, the lenses are so good, that wouldn't anybody here be able to look at the moon and see evidence that we are currently there, or would we do it? On the dark side of the moon, outside of prying eyes, because any amateur astronomer right now could possibly see moon activity. Yeah. Um, in terms of activity, I don't see much. But I've had people come up to me at a co lot of conferences, like up at um, up in San Francisco at the New Living Expo. Last year, a guy brought some pictures. He showed me some on his phone that he'd taken with his 16-inch uh, telescope. And they were really impressive kind of in the lunar limb there, but, you know, where you can actually get a good view and get some nice shading and shadows so you can actually make things out. And there certainly was the appearance of um, buildings and so forth. Whether they were active or not, I can't tell you. But, yeah, to me, logically, if you're going to build that, like you say, and you want to keep it away from prying eyes, you're going to put it on the backside of the moon, not the front, where everybody can spot it. Now, why would we, uh, why would we stop Apollo? I mean, why why stop when the dreams of the 60s and the 50s about, you know, the, the next frontier is space and we're going to go and occupy it, hotels and, and commercialization and, 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 you know, moon trips and everything else that we had planned. Why stop? Yeah, everything you saw in 2001 basically didn't didn't ever happen. Um, well, I mean, what there's the the overt, fairly obvious conclusion you can come to just by looking at it is that you know i mean basically what happened was is that is that the old kennedy new frontier liberalism died and they were replaced you know remember the democrats had control of both houses of congress at that time it was replaced by sort of the new 
welfare state liberals, and they didn't want to spend the money on the space program anymore. So they cut off the funding. And, you know, there's there's a very famous story where Nixon went to Congress and said, you know, I want $12 billion to build a space shuttle. And Congress said, okay, here's $6 billion. And that's why we ended up with four, you know, gigantic, multi-parted, basically single point failures. The shuttle was a, was a, a walking, breathing, single, you know, single point failure built right into it. It simply was one of those things where, you know, there were so many ways that that spacecraft could be destroyed or could blow up because they simply had to make so many compromises in the design. So I just think it was overtly just the politics of, of the country changed at well, that time. And, and I agree that that was the public's version of the story. But why would we stop the space program? Because we got what we wanted. Nobody else was capable of going to the moon at that time. And we had control of everything. It's kind of like kind of like the petrodollar. We had a monopoly on, on you know, the exchange of oil worldwide with the petrodollar. We also had a monopoly on Anunnaki technology left behind on the moon because we were the only ones that had been there and had brought it back. And nobody else could go at that time. Nobody else had the technological capability or the money to go there. The Russians had spent all this money and failed and they didn't want to bother. So maybe we came back and said, you know, we got everything we wanted and maybe we promised some of our superpower enemies, the Chinese and the Russians, we'll share with you stuff that we find just just so, you know just to avoid a war i don't know but i mean to me that makes a lot of sense too so that's that's kind of the scenario that the way i look at it is that it was simply we found what we wanted and we came home the russians were so far ahead of us sputnik right mm -hmm. I, I, their rocket technology and everything yeah. was was way ahead of ours but yet they never put a man on the moon and that is the obvious question <clears throat> why didn't they or did they and we just don't know about it. Well, you know, we had we had Herman Oberth and we had Werner von Braun. And by the way, Oberth was von Braun's mentor. And he said overtly, I was tweeting about this on Twitter with some of the some of the fader knots. He said overtly that one of the ways that we got all this technology is that we had help from the people of other worlds. So he stated that overtly in an interview. But the Russians had their own genius. It was a guy named Kolarov, and he was the inventor of all their rockets, and he was he was killed in a test of their big Nova rocket. They had the same idea that we had, which was the only way to get to the moon and back was direct ascent. And they were building this gigantic rocket called the Nova. And they were testing that and it exploded on the pad. And the explosion was so much larger than anybody thought it was going to be that he and a bunch of other top scientists were killed right in the bunker a couple of miles away from the launch uh, launching pad. So when he died, it would be as if we had lost von Braun before we'd, we'd finished the Saturn V. And... Without him, it would have been a much tougher thing to get to the moon. And I think that that was one of the things that set them back. And um, and in terms of them going, there's no evidence they went. But, um, you know, uh, it, it's always possible, I suppose. I just I just haven't seen, you know, Jimmy, I hear these stories. I just haven't seen any proof of them. To me, at this point, they're just stories. Well, and, and okay, now let's go back to Solar Warden and what McKinnon had said. I I like his story, and I, the reason why I like his story is <laughs> the governments were involved. You know, you had you had the White House yeah. and and Buckingham Palace fighting over this guy. The, the the fact that he did break into the computers actually did happen, and uh, so when you have two governments fighting over him, uh, says that what happened happened. The question is what he says he saw now that's that's the interesting thing um but i think there's something to his story when it comes to solar warden and that type of secret space program now all bets are off that's a whole nother can of worms yeah i agree the thing is you know i do believe mckinnon and the fact that they're prosecuting him is prosecuting him as an indication that he's on to something it reminds me of twa 800 which is when i first got into conspiracy theories and started to believe in them like, for instance, they went after um, they went after the guy who released the radar tapes of um, TWA 800 being shot down by a missile. The government denied. They said that the radar tapes were fake, but then they prosecuted him for releasing them. They prosecuted him for for, for stealing government property. Well, it can't, it can't be both things. They can't be fakes and be government property. And it's the same kind of thing with McKinnon. If his story was nonsense, if he was a liar, then they wouldn't be prosecuting him. But beyond that, 
there's no documents. It's not like we found some separate documents in the National Archives that support, you know, Warden, Warden and all these other ideas. So to me, it's a story that's not as strong, um, except for the fact the government's going after him. To me, like MJ-12 is very strong because you have these documents that have surfaced that appear to be authentic, that, that support the idea that it actually existed. Whereas with Solar Warden, you really don't have, you don't have any backing other than, than the fact that McKinnon is made credible by the fact that they tried to extradite him and prosecute him. Is it possible to have a program such as Solar Warden uh, that McKinnon talked about? Is it possible to fund that, build it, get it up there, staff it without the public knowing? Oh, absolutely. Uh, because the thing is, is that, you know, you're – you're not going to be able to see every object in the sky that might be traveling back and forth to and from the moon. It, even if you do, um, there's going to be ways to account for it. You're going to be able to say, oh, it was some sort of satellite. I mean, absolutely, you could launch these things, build bases on the back side of the moon. And uh, by the way, there is no dark side of the moon. There's just a back side and a front side because every part of the moon is illuminated at some point except for the some craters at the poles. But uh, the point being that, yeah, you could absolutely do that, and especially if they actually had – some form of flying saucer technology, which I think we had developed by the early 60s, um, then absolutely that kind of thing would be fairly easy to do. And you could lift enormous payloads and get all kinds of equipment up there and people and build a base. But the, the problem is we just don't have any proof. I and mean, we don't even have a picture. I would love to have somebody inside NASA or the DOD leak us a picture of one of the active working moon bases. That would be, that would be really cool. Because at least then... We could study and argue about whether it was an authentic picture or whether it was a fake, right? We, we'd at least have that. But right now we got nothing. With uh, where would they launch from? I mean, you've got to do this away from the public. Where would they launch? Right. Well, there have, been, there have been rumors that there is a secret space shuttle launching facility in Utah for like over 20 years. Those rumors have been out there. And it's at 6,500 feet altitude. And that would really make a lot of sense. If you were going to build this thing, you know, at first with chemical rockets, let's say you didn't have your flying saucer technology fully developed yet, or you couldn't lift massive payloads with it. The way to put this stuff up in orbit and to build these orbiting space platforms would be to launch from a secret base out in the middle of nowhere, Utah is basically unpopulated. That's why it only has three electoral votes. And, you know, the thing is, that first 6,500 feet, that is the most expensive part of any rocket launch because of the amount of energy, fuel, and money that goes into just getting that payload that first 6,500 feet. That's, that's really expensive. And so you would be able to do it cheaply and quietly and with very little um, – very little chance of being observed if you had a secret base in the middle of nowhere, Utah, at high altitude. And I, and I suspect that's where they would have launched them from. What about uh, the Guyana Space Launch Center that they built, you know, at the tip of uh, uh, northern side of uh, South America? Oh, yeah. I mean, again, there's another thing there you could you could launch from there. There's, there's different facilities all over the place. There's even... Um, What's the Russian facility? Baikonur. I mean, it's in the middle of nowhere in Russia, Siberia somewhere. And, um, you know, nobody – it's really hard to monitor everything that comes out of there, especially if it's cleared by the Defense Department. I mean, in other words, if CIA or NSA is launching some mission from, let's say, the Baikonur Cosmodrome and everybody knows about it, it's still kept secret by the fact that everybody's taking security oaths and it's not talked about. In terms of the general public, you'd never know. They could be launching right now. We'd never know it. Uh, look at – Look at what just happened, what, last year with the rocket launch from um, Vandenberg up the California coast that everybody saw and freaked out about, right? So, yeah. you know, that came as a total shock. Nobody knew that they were launching rockets out of there at that time. It, 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 we, were taken, we were taken aback by it. So, you know, normally if you're going to do a secret space program launch, you're not going to do it over the city of Los Angeles. But, you know, bottom line is you can absolutely do this kind of thing in total secrecy. Let's uh, take a break right there. Our guest tonight, Mike Barra. He's here tonight, and he's not disappointing me. My goodness, Mike. You've been waiting for this. It's like wind up, wind him up and let him go. This is Fade to Black. I'm here with Church on the Game Changer Network and KGRA The Planet. More with Barra right after this. here we listen to jimmy church you're listening to fade to black oh 
always on the edge of the hottest alternative talk. Jimmy Church with Fade to Black. KGRARadio.com ¿Qué tal mis amigos? Yo soy Mario Carson, el tiburón. Y los invito para que escuchen a mi buen amigo Jimmy Church Radio. ¡Claro que sí! FoodForLiberty.com sells high-quality, storable foods from Numana. Whether you want to be prepared in the event of an emergency or an outdoor sports enthusiast, FoodForLiberty.com has your prepackaged single-serve packs or kits for the entire family. Numana is known for high-quality, great-tasting, GMO-free, super-nutritious food with no chemical preservatives. With a 25-year shelf life, you can't beat the feeling of being food secure when you need it most. Right now, FoodForLiberty.com is offering a special gift, a heavy-duty survivor dry storage box designed for extreme bug-out conditions. This storage box is built to last, includes compass, signaling mirror, and is yours free with a $50 order. Go to foodforliberty.com right now and pick up your quality storable foods from Numana. To get the survivor dry storage box, use promo code LIBERTY. It makes good sense to be prepared. Go to foodforliberty.com. Did you ever turn to your radio for your favorite talk show to find that it's been preempted for this? In the air, a deep right center. That goes Lewis to the wall, and it's all here! Or this? And I'm ashamed of you, Hillary, for voting for it. Do you have a favorite talk radio program that's not available in your city? Just go to TalkStreamLive.com for links to the best streaming talk radio shows. At TalkStream Live, you will find live talk shows 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. All your favorites are here. With such a large selection, you will also discover some new favorites. On the go and still want to listen? With the mobile smartphone, simply type TalkStream Live on your internet browser. Now you can take internet radio with with you. You will also find hundreds of music, news, and sports streams. Best of all, the TalkStream Live directory is free and there's never a login required. Remember TalkStreamLive.com, the fastest route between you and your favorite talk radio show. You are listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. Oi, oi, I'm Reese Evans. You're listening to Jimmy Church. This is Revolution. The Revolution will not be televised. The Revolution is on radio. Ciao. Welcome back, Fade to Black. Our guest tonight, Mike Barra. Tomorrow night, the one and only William Henry is going to be here. Wednesday night, Nick Redfern. Thursday night, Peter Joseph, director of the Zeitgeist film series, and also John Rappaport, of course, is going to join us. Check this out. Sad day today. Anton Yelchin. He was the actor that was known for playing Chekhov in the new Star Trek films, was killed by his own car as it rolled down his driveway early yesterday morning. The car pinned him against a brick mailbox pillar and a security fence at his home here in Los Angeles. And he had gotten out of his car, forgot to put it in park. And apparently, for some reason, went down the driveway and was doing something and then got run over he was on his way to meet friends for a rehearsal and then when he didn't show up the group showed up at his home and found him dead pinned between the mailbox and his car sad day sad all right all right mike yeah it's you know it's tragic to report news like that but i gotta tell you he played a pretty good check off man he did yeah he did it you know it's it's crazy sad it's just really a strange um story it sounds like i guess that the suv he owned had a recall on the parking brake or something it sounds like he kind of left it running at the top of a of his driveway and it rolled back down it just what a 
what a weird tragic way to go i mean i i um I was at the Roxy, oh geez, about five years ago, and I was there to see the Donnas, and some local band opened up, and, and I'm looking at the guitar player, and I'm thinking, I think I know who this guy is, and I realized it was him, it was Anton Yelchin, and Chekhov was up there, and you know, and I went and said hi afterwards and stuff, but he couldn't have been nicer, and it just, it's so, it's so sad, that because he's only 27, I think, you yeah, know, and the guy yeah, had a, yeah. he had a great career ahead of him, you know, we've lost, I'm not saying Anton Yelchin was an icon, but I mean, we've lost so many iconic figures already this year. I mean, Muhammad Ali, just a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. And, Friday, that uh, that happened uh, Friday night, man. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, in the desert. yeah. Yeah. It was just really, um, really been a rough, strange year. It's like a lot of people are leaving um, the planet for whatever reason. I, I don't know. I'm not sure I know what the reason is, but you know, that was really sad. And I think he was a talented guy. You know what? I'm going to say this really quick to everybody. I'm doing the show for the first time with my Father's Day gift from uh, my daughter, Deanna. She got me uh, the the Beats, right? The, head mm, the headphones, yeah. the, the new Solo 2s. And you know how good these headphones are? And they are amazing. But, Mike, they actually make you sound smart. <laughs> they're that oh, good yeah you're so funny they're yeah, that put a bump is this thing yeah. on is this thing on is it working is this thing on right yeah. thing on? <laughs> no, uh, I, I, I just got to thank her these are just amazing headphones and i've been using you know the sony v6s forever which are this uh, the the studio standard right mm -hmm. and i gotta tell you man these beats are everything that they it, say they are oh my it was God. worth it to have her just to get those yeah, right <laughs> yeah it took 21 years but yeah these things <laughs> sound amazing um now uh back to uh back to solar warden no actually i want to i want to change i want to change gears a little bit i want to talk okay. about nasa photographs and when we talk about a, a secret space program with nasa certainly uh i have seen evidence that their photographs are altered now if you are going to alter a photograph in a general sense and not tell anybody about it and i'm talking about removing the Hasselblad, you know, crosshairs and things like that mm -hmm. in the photographs mm -hmm. that then you're alter you're altering all kinds of stuff that you're not telling us about. What's the best evidence of an altered NASA photograph? Well, no, I, let me ask you, are they even doing it? Oh yeah, they they definitely are doing it. I mean, the you know, the the whole image that uh caused a lot of controversy for me with uh Stuart back in um in 2012, the so-called ziggurat image um, on the backside of the moon of this big pyramid that was back there, that's the most, that's completely obvious that it, the images have been altered. And, you know, again, I can just show you repeatedly all kinds of images that have been taken from uh, one that was pilfered off the desk of the director of NASA uh, in the 19, um, mid-1970s, that is of Mari Christian that shows this glass spire sticking up out of the ground with support wires on it and stuff. And then you go to the, you go to the NASA website now and you look at the same frame number and it, all that stuff is just whitewashed out. So, I mean, the evidence simply exists that you can compare images that are from original photographic prints from first generation back in the 1960s with what's on, on the web now. And they're just very, they're very different. There's a lot of, of stuff that's just removed from them. Um, and why you do it is because you don't want people to have a smoking gun that everybody can look at and go, oh, my God, there's a pyramid on the moon. That's that's the reason you do it. Yeah. But once you're caught, aren't you completely guilty? Well, I yeah, mean, you're guilty. But you know, the thing is, there's just you have this threshold of disbelief that you can't get over uh, with a lot of this stuff. I mean, basically, there are some people that are not going to believe that NASA has hidden or faked anything, no matter what you show them. And as long as there is that that group of people that are, you know, so invested in the um, traditional way of thinking about NASA and the space program, and it's all open and honest, you, you know, sometimes in some cases, their mortgages depend on that. And, you know, you're just not going to crack them. And so you're really only, you know, you're really preaching to the choir. One of the things that uh, most people don't understand today because of Photoshop and computers and the generation today has grown up with this technology. Mm -hmm. But when you go back to altering photographs uh, before the computer age, uh, certainly before 1990, I'll just pull a round number out. You can go yeah. to 95, but let's go before 1990. 
you had to manipulate either a, a print, you had to manipulate the negative, or you had to do both. And that was a talent. You were an artiste. Yes, yes. Not, not, not only with an airbrush, and that was even more rare, but with an exacto knife and a negative, and you're scraping away the negative and then repainting the negative with opaque paint and then re, um, re manipulating the opaque paint. I did that for a job. It was my job. That's what I did. <laughs> so I know, oh, I, I so know it's you, I, you're I, the one to blame for all, this, hey man, all these I, shenanigans uh, to I, use that I, word again. I worked at Bell Labs, man. And Bell Labs uh, taught me really well um, how to uh, uh, manipulate photographs. Now we didn't do it to deceive the public. We did it for manufacturing. Okay. Mm -hmm. But I know the process that has to take place. So therefore wh where I'm going is that there are NASA artists out there that had this for a job, but they aren't talking. Why, why do you think that that is? Why wouldn't somebody come forward and say, look, I removed the Hasselblad hash marks. No big deal. You know, but not even that has come forward. Well, they have. They actually have. I mean, you got Ken Johnston Jr. is a friend of mine. to talk about him in Dark Mission, and we talk about him in Ancient Aliens on the Moon. And he actually worked at the Lunar Receiving Laboratory. He was in charge of, of the photographs there. Basically, you know, he kept control of them and made sure they were taken care of. And he said he went through the, the you know, photo lab one time, and he saw people sitting there with airbrushes doing exactly what you talked about, airbrushing the negatives. And he said it didn't occur to him until years later when all this stuff came out. Why would you do that? Because, you know, you, you never – you might clean up a print, right, to send it to Life magazine. Let's say Life or – Life magazine. Remember Life magazine wants to do a picture about the moon landings? And so you take those images and you clean them up and you remove things like Hasselblad marks just to make them look really nice and, and clean and, and it's the kind of thing you want to put into a frame and put up on your wall. That's one thing. But you never alter the negatives because the negatives are your official record of what was actually recorded by the camera on the surface of the moon. So he actually reported it very clearly and said he saw this stuff going on, um, not really thinking too much of it at the time. But the bottom line is, if it's not – if nobody cares about it, then it, it doesn't make a difference. In other words, if the media doesn't pick it up and report on it, it it's not going to matter. There are things that go on in politics all the time. But basically, the mainstream media just does not report. There are facts that are, would be embarrassing to one candidate or another that simply don't get put out. And, you know, there, there's various reasons for that. All the, all the reporters knew that JFK was having multiple affairs with multiple women in and out of the White House at all times, and nobody said anything. So if it's not stated in the press in, you know, widespread knowledge and widespread to a widespread knowledge base, then it doesn't really exist, does it? Well, it's kind of like I like to say that that everything nothing is nothing happened unless it's on Facebook, but nothing on Facebook is real. That's kind of what we're looking at today. Yeah. Yeah. And Zuckerberg is a, a reptilian. He just admitted it. Oh, yeah, that's right. I saw you that. saw that, right? Yeah. Um, He's got the same eyes as the queen. Yeah. Uh, that's an interesting. Uh, and Steve story Bassett, by the way, I've seen a video where Steve Bassett has reptilian eyes also. So. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. He, I didn't know that about him. He's going to be on the show next week. Uh, we'll have to ask him about <laughs> ask that. Ask him about it. Yeah. yeah so, yeah. Um, but, but my point is, and I understand about Fisher, but what I'm saying is the actual artists themselves. Yeah. You know, somebody coming forward and saying, look, you know, uh, there was nothing strange there. Yeah, we were airbrushing stuff all the time, but it was for Life magazine or well, I think that, somebody I think that, to, or somebody to come forward and go, you know what, man, there was a couple of crafts in the background and we had to take them out. I thought that there have been people that have told stories like that. I think Nick Redfern in some of his books has mentioned that he's talked to people at NASA that said that they've, you know, I think I don't know that he's named names, but he has contacts or people he could he could introduce to you that actually did do that. And it's saying, Oh yeah, we take UFOs out of pictures, you know, satellite images all the time. Um, so I, I believe there are reports out there like that. It's just that they're kind of buried deeply, you know, in, in different uh, books and publications, you kind of got to dig for it. But I think that stuff's out there.
do not you, to disagree with you, but I, I do believe there are some reports out there like that. You're not disagreeing with me. I, what I'm saying is it's just a massive cover up. You know, why haven't we been able to get at some of these people? Because if the Hasselblad crosshairs are removed, then it is being done, period. And they well, won't, they won't not even... necessarily because like over the white of a white can definitely bleed, especially in old photographic prints and negatives. White can kind of bleed into that and, and sort of obscure it if the crosshair is over the white part of a spacesuit, for instance. So that's not 100% true. You can't have kind of a natural obscuration of the Rizu marks. Remember, those Rizu marks were very, very, very thin, only, only a fraction of a millimeter, I think. So they were very thin. But they were on every image, Mike. Yeah. Yeah, they were they were actually they were actually on the photographic plates. Yeah, they were actually there for sure. So. That, that's all that I'm saying. And if, if you're going to remove one thing, then there's other stuff that you. Well, can what do. I'm saying is it doesn't mean it's because it's not it's not there or uh, a reason mark is not completely there. doesn't necessarily mean that there were shenanigans going on, to use the word for the fourth time. No, no, um, no, it, no. It could, it could. There could be some ways where it just kind of disappears in the in the processing. Yeah. And, and but that's not my point. I'm talking about when you see both images. One with and one oh, without. Yeah. yeah. That's right. what I'm talking about. That's, right. Okay. Yeah. That's where I'm going. Um, now, and, and now back to McKinnon. When it comes to uh, uh, what he had accessed, do you think that there's the possibility of a slip up eventually where something is going to get exposed? One of those UFO folders, you know, is going to hit the mainstream and get out on WikiLeaks. Well, I'm so cynical. I don't think it's going to be an accident. I, I don't think something's going to slip through the cracks. I mean, things do slip through the cracks, but I don't think anything that huge is going to slip through the cracks. I think somebody could potentially leak something the way the MJ-12 documents were leaked. So, you know, I mean, the people, people that try to say MJ-12 documents, for instance, were phonies or fakes or forgeries – the fact is, is that, you know, um, a lot of the supporting documents, there were t guys were tipped off. Stanton Friedman was told, look in the back of box 135 in your Freedom of Information request. And he goes back there and there's an MJ-12 document. You know, somebody put it in there. So that tells you something simply by the fact that you would find the document tells you that somebody on the inside is trying to get the information out. Now, whether that is part of the broader agenda or whether you've got an internal whistleblower who's trying to, like, leak something to me jimmy it's going to be a deliberate leak it's not going to be an accident that we find something significant like that or maybe there'll be a roster that will be released of the different spacecraft and stuff that they're on and what their names are you know who are these astronauts well that's that's the other thing and the the navy when it comes to this and how mckinnon described it mckinnon uh to me now i've never spoken to him so let's uh, let's make that clear here. But McKinnon just hits me like uh, like a kid, okay, in that he was just out just trying to find stuff, right? Uh, he doesn't— Like uh, like Matthew Broderick in War Games or something? Yeah, well, he was just kind of yes, poking around? Yes, yeah. exactly. I, McKinnon is not a physicist, okay? So when he describes, you know, the Navy being involved in this and how the Navy— and that. It was just a bizarre thing to come out like that. It sounded factually based to me. It wasn't NASA. It wasn't, you know, a, a space program or anything else. And, you know, or mentioning something like MJ-12. No, he went at the Navy and 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 the way that the uh, uh, the staff was named. You know, mm -hmm. uh, like, you know, like naval, uh, uh, what, what's the word that I want to uh, use? Well, the, U the U.S. Office of Naval Intelligence has been deeply involved in all kinds of extraterrestrial research for a long, long time. You know, they've been targeted. Uh, that's who Bob Lazar Bob was Bob Lazar, through, that's where I right? was going. And, and, and that's another thing is that one of the things that, one of the reasons why I believe Bob Lazar tells the truth and is telling the truth is that when I listen to him talk, you know, I'm an engineer and I deal, I've dealt with for years, I've dealt with other engineers and I've dealt with physicists and scientists as we've tried different things. And the bottom line is, you know, Lazar talks like one of us. He just, he has this, this in, inclination, this tone, this way of speaking that indicates um, a certain amount of education and engineering and scientific expertise. So, you know, that's one of the things that gives it credibility. So I, I think that's a really significant factor. Yeah, I, I have often tried with Lazar, right? 
to mm-hmm. imagine myself trying to BS my way through uh, one of his conversations, right? Yeah. I, I couldn't do it. I, there's no way that I could pass the smell test there. There's just no way. And Lazar does. I, I don't care what any physicist says. He, yeah. And the thing is, is they're all they're all sort of, you know, coming at it from their perspective of our current understanding of physics. Well, if history's taught us anything is that our current understanding of physics is completely different 50 or 100 years from now. So, you know, and, and again, they have now discovered element 115. So he was right about that. And, um, you know, we're getting there. We're getting to understanding what what he's talking about. And the other thing, too, Jimmy, is like you look at stuff like like Project Serpo, which is I'm, I'm going to do some work on that for the book. I'm going to talk about that. And people say, oh, it's a fake website and it's all a hoax and blah, 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 blah. And I'm sitting there thinking, OK, it, it, follow me on this. All right. Isn't the point of a hoax to show people how clever you are and that you fooled them with a hoax? And are you really going to spend, I mean, if you go through Serpo, there is so much material in there. There is such a massive volume of information. You're talking about somebody spending hundreds, if not thousands and thousands of hours of their lives creating all of this stuff in incredibly rich detail and with a tremendous amount of internal consistency. I mean, even if you go to the Reagan transcript, you know, the way Reagan talks to the other aides that are briefing him and the way some of the people in the room talk, it's like it's like they got the personalities exactly right. They got Colby correct. They got Reagan correct to, to put that kind of effort into it and detail into it. And it's 10 years later. And the guy who supposedly created the hoax still hasn't come forward and said, I fooled all of you. I mean, that doesn't make any sense to me. So I don't I think if, if it's a hoax. If these things are hoaxes, if these documents are hoaxes, then why haven't the people that pulled off the hoax come forward and take taken credit for it and become heroes to the skeptical inquirer crowd? It just doesn't add up to me. Have you read all of the Serpo website? I can't say I've read all of it, but I've read a significant portion of it at this point. Okay. I, I read it uh well, I've I've gone through it a few times. I've read all of it. Wow. But, but I I read it in real time. Okay, I would go there every single day looking for the new post. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, there was portions of it that uh, to me felt authentic. Okay, there was was portions of it that felt really spot on, that felt authentic. Um, I, I, I don't know what to think today, but just like John Teeter or other things like that and Serpo and MJ12 too, for that matter. Uh, with Serpo, uh, nobody's been caught. The way that Bill Ryan backed off of it as quick as he did um, said one of two things, and I've never talked to Bill about this, uh, but either that they got too close to the fire, right, and, mm-hmm. and got scared and, 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 and backed off, or B, he found out that it was all BS. You know, it's, it's one or the other, and Bill's never really said either. Right. So you don't know what his conclusion was. And, you know, again, to me, unless there's some strong evidence that it is a hoax and I haven't seen any yet to to really convince me, I think it stands. I think you got to say that the information stands. Now, it may not be the entire story. It may only be a portion of the story. You know, why didn't why didn't Bob Dean's um, assessment, the the giant report that he read in NATO headquarters, why didn't it mention Project Serpo? Um, possibly because it really hadn't taken place yet, or possibly because it was so secret that the people who wrote the assessment didn't know about it. But these things, as they are right now, they, you know, to me, the information stands until somebody proves it wrong. And nobody's, nobody, to my mind, has falsified the MJ-12 documents yet. And nobody's falsified the Serpo thing yet. Well, I have issues with MJ-12. I'll just say it right now. Uh, uh, William Moore. And th- that right there and the whole Jamie Shandera aspect of it, you yeah. know, I'm not saying it's all bogus, but Bill Moore is bogus. And what Bill Moore did to not only ufology and hardworking researchers out there and and witnesses and so forth, was he he forced us to go back 10 years. And, and that, that to me and the whole MJ-12 thing and everything that he had ever done – uh, you have to cast a, a really black shadow on all of it. And uh, and Jamie Shandera, man. Uh, and that's the part of it. You know, now the twining memo. 
okay, you know what? There's a possibility that that's the one document out of all of them that are solid. The rest of it was part of it real, part of it wasn't. Uh, you know, Richard Doty's involved, and he's as shady as anybody can get. And, mm-hmm. and that part of the MJ-12 documents, I have to just step back and and wonder about. Look, they're wonderful looking. Uh, they're period pieces. There was a lot of research that was done on that. You know, and if they're bogus, somebody somewhere with a typewriter was typing a thousand pages to get one good one. Right? Yeah, that was perfect. And and that evidence is out there somewhere. And I could see Doty and his crew and more, you know, sitting there typing somewhere and creating this stuff. Uh, I, I man. Well, I, I mean, the other thing, too, Jimmy, is, is if I'm not mistaken. MJ-12 actually was transmitted via microfilm. And I believe that that original microfilm was examined by Stan Friedman, if I'm not mistaken. 30, I, that may 30, not be the case. 35, but, 35 millimeter camera shots. OK, which is still not the easiest thing. OK, 35 millimeter camera shots would be a lot easier than microfilm. Um, but the thing is, is that I, I met Bill Moore a couple times in the late 90s when I was hanging around with Mr. H. And, um, you know, I, I didn't like him and I didn't really trust him when I met him, but I did talk to some other people who knew him quite well, who I think are credible people. I don't know if I can mention their names, but, um, they believed in him and they thought he was honest and they thought he was uh, terrific at what he did. So there's that aspect to it. But then, you know, you look at, uh, um, majesticdocuments.com. You talk to Dr. Bob Wood. I mean, he's right there in Orange County. You can go down to some Orange County MUFON meeting and talk to Dr. Bob Wood sometime. And he is absolutely a documents expert. And he is absolutely 100% convinced that they're legitimate documents. So, you know, it, when you when I look at it through that lens, I, I, I hate to depend on authority figures, but I think that the arguments that Dr. Wood makes with, you know, I can't analyze the 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 ink on the pen and the paper and all those things that he the kinds of things that he does, but uh, the, the the things that he points out are to me very very credible arguments. And I'm not gonna, again I'm not going to depend on on Doctor Wood's opinion, but I think that it what he says is consistent and what the critics talk about is not a big deal. I mean, I don't think that the points are very valid. The fact that Truman's signature on the executive order is the same as it is on other documents. You know, they had this thing called a pentagraph where you, uh, the, the president would sign one document and then there were multiple pens attached to it. And it would sign like 10 or 12 documents at a time with the exact same signatures. So, yeah, yeah, there's there's you know. all, there's all of that, except this is where this is where I back up again with Bill Moore and Jamie Shandero chasing money. They, that's all they were about. They, they, mm-hmm. they weren't about the truth. They were about having a publishing company and making documentaries and looking for a TV show. That's what they were. That's all their mission was. And then if you are getting fed, the reason why so many researchers loved Bill Moore and, and thought that he was the shiz nickel is because he's getting documents fed to him from the air force office of special operations and office of disinformation. Yeah. 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 yeah, uh, From, from Doty and they were creating, uh, uh, real documents. So for Wood to say that these are real, of course they're real documents, but are are the contents of them real that the, to the, the paper, uh, we, we don't have any paper, but the, the style, the typewriters mm-hmm. and all of that and and the vernacular and the way that uh, the military wrote stuff and the way that the White House and so forth would have written stuff. So there's inconsistencies there. I get that. But generally speaking, if you need to create a, a an authentic looking document without having the real paper and it's going to be photographed. Yeah. And I and I understand and, and respect Bob Wood and his son and their research. No doubt about it. But you have to consider where. Bill Moore was getting these documents from the king of disinfo, Richard Doty. This is Fade to Black. We'll talk more about this when we come back, Mike. I I, I like where you're coming from. All right. I do. I like where you're All coming right. from. But, right. but Bill Moore, who is a janitor right now at a junior high school somewhere in Pennsylvania, living in a trailer, <laughs> deserves where he's at. This is Fade to Black. I'm your Jimmy Church. More with Barra right after this. Hi, everybody. This is Rob Halford, the Metal Guard, on JimmyChurchRadio.com. KGRA Radio. Intelligent Talk. 
So, you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on, 24-7, with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online, or on any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. Would you like freedom from health insurance? You're not alone. Whether you're self-employed, a small business owner, or an individual who purchases health care for yourself and your family, Liberty Health Share could be the answer. Liberty Health Share has united a community of like-minded people that actually share health care costs. And Liberty Health Share members are exempt from IRS penalties associated with the Affordable Care Act. Imagine freedom from insurance. You choose your own doctor and hospital. Your medical provider simply submits your bills to to Liberty Health Share for processing. Why wait? You do have choices. Together we're changing health care for good. Find out more and get a free monthly estimate right now. For a limited time, use promo code TALK to save $50 when you enroll. Go to libertyhealthshare.com forward slash options. That's libertyhealthshare.com forward slash options. Hi, I'm Richard Dolan. When I'm not hosting my radio program, The Richard Dolan Show on KGRA, or writing new books on UFOs, I run a publishing company. I'm proud to say that Richard Dolan Press has published some of the most fascinating books available on UFOs and related subjects. They include Dr. Bruce Maccabee's classic analysis of the UFO cover-up, David Marler's breakthrough book on triangular UFOs, Dr. Richard Souter's unique work on underground bases, and other classics by Grant Cameron, Chase Kletsky, and Dr. Bob Wood. Not to mention intriguing works by Eve Lorgan and Laurie McDonald that deal with truly bizarre phenomena. I'm proud to publish such high quality and original works, and there are several amazing books about to be released over the next few months. Go to richarddolanpress.com to learn more. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi available, you can still listen to every minute of Fade to Black by just calling 605-562-4482. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan and no extra cost if you have unlimited minutes. Just call 605-562-4482. You can listen to me, Jimmy Church, on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Go back, Lee Tappy. You want to know a secret? I love ponies. I really love ponies. I'm serious. I couldn't stay sane without ponies to brush. Why fade to black? Because you never got that pony. Damn it. This is Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. Right on, right on, right on. Fade to Black. Got my new beats. Solo twos on. Man, these things sound so good. Wonder what they sound like with some Van Halen cranking through them. I'm going to find out after the show tonight for show. Our guest tonight, Mike Barra. Tomorrow night, I want to remind everybody, we got a big week lined up here. Tomorrow night, William Henry. Wednesday night, Nick Redfern. Thursday night, Peter Josephs. So we've got a huge, and, and John Rappaport. Big week lined up in front of us. Hey, Mike, um, I want to change gears up just a little bit. Um, let me see here. Stargazer just tweeted out, what the heck is Serpo? What are you guys talking about? Please explain. <laughs> you and I, you said it earlier. We can talk about Roswell or whatever, Rendlesham and go off. And there's a lot of people that don't know some of the things that you and I, we we take for granted that everybody knows what Serpo is. Um, what was Project Serpo? Mike, did we lose Barra? Mike, hit the mute, <laughs> hit the <laughs> mute button. I know. <laughs> no, it wasn't that. I got to admit it. I was, I was catching up on Game of Thrones. So, uh, <laughs> sorry. What? Uh, yeah, I suck. 
You didn't see Game of Thrones last night? Well, well, I did, but but because the Penny Dreadful series finale was on at the same time as Game of Thrones at high definition, dude, I watched it in low definition. So now I was now my brother's watching it in high definition. Dude, Penny it, Dreadful so. sucks. Oh, it's an amazing show. Great no, show. Fantastic sucks. writing, acting. Sucks. Sucks. Great show. No, Great no, show. sucks. Great show. But but <laughs> Game of Thrones last night, they they got some stuff out of the way. In a, oh man. Yeah, I think I think LeBron and Sansa Stark probably had the best days of their lives yesterday. Yeah, <laughs> well, I, I got to tell you, man, I've been waiting for old Ramsey to go down, and he mm-hmm. he went down correctly yesterday. That was a, that was pretty damn amazing. Well, I could have thought of a couple of additional things they could have thrown in there. Yeah, yeah, but you know, hey. Yeah, yeah, that was pretty good. That 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 battle scene with Ramsey and Jon Snow. Oh man. That was yeah. gnarly, man. I mean, I was I The was, battle of the uh, Yeah, I, what what do they call it? The battle of the I can't say the word, right? Yeah. Battle of the Bees. Yeah. Um, you know it took them 25 days to film that battle sequence. Man, 25. I was 25. I was so claustrophobic, you know, yeah. when Jon Snow was buried under bodies. Oh. Oh yeah. lord. And you know, you know what was funny? Rita Rita turned to me and she goes, you know, that's probably about what it was like. And I was like, mm-hmm. you, you know what? Probably. Man, that was gnarly. Okay, back to uh, Serpo. Stargazer needs you, uh, you know, like I was just saying, some people just don't know uh, about some history here. So what was Project Serpo? Well, the what was Project Serpo? Um, or is? Well, is, was, is, uh, as the story goes... There was a, a crash uh, in Roswell, New Mexico in 1947, and there was one survivor whose name was E.B., E-B-E, Extraterrestrial Biological Entity. And he lived for a few years, but during the time he was in captivity, he was able to establish contact, contact with his home world or with a, an outpost or something and tell them that he was uh, on the earth and he was stranded and could they please come get him. And that sequence was repeated or shown in you know the et phone home se- sequence in the film et that's where that was taken from supposedly and the story goes that he told them while he was in ca- captivity that he was from this planet in the zeta reticuli star system which is a binary star system and that <clears throat> he um it, the planet was basically named Serpo or some word that sounded like Serpo. It became known as the code name was Serpo, S-E-R-P-O. And um, that in the 1960s, after E.B. died, there was contact established between the U.S. government and the Ebens, as they were called, from Serpo. And that in the 1960s, from I think 64 was the was, was when we sent a group of 12 men or 10 men and two women, the stories vary, to this planet aboard an Ebon spaceship. And they lived there, and and all of them didn't come back until the late 1970s, 1978. And they all subsequently have lived out the rest of their lives on planet Earth uh, and passed away, except I think for two that fell in love with Serpo and the culture and the Ebbins and decided to stay there. And so that's the basic story. And again, that this exchange program is reflected in the final scenes of Close Encounters of the Third Kind, where a team of pre-selected astronauts gets aboard the alien mothership and flies away to wherever their home planet is. So that's the basic story. And how did, and, and I'm going to post the Serpo links here in just a second. How did it come to, to light? How was it exposed? Well, how it was exposed is that in 2005, this website just appears on the uh, web called serpo.org, S-E-R-P-O.org, and it has a ton of information, a bunch of updates, basically supposedly authorized document uh, releases to tell people about the background of um, these 12 astronauts that went, military ast- astronauts that went to um, Serpo between 65 and 78. I guess it was 65 and 78. And it has things like, again, it has the Reagan presidential briefing from 1981 telling them about the aliens. It has uh, what is supposedly the notes taken by one of the astronauts who went there, all describing all the things he saw. And again, the level of detail as to what the planet was like and how they lived and the games that they played and their work hours and the things that they did and the wars that they had fought and all this stuff is really, really highly detailed. And it's fascinating stuff. So even if... um. Even if it didn't happen, it's worth a read because it, it, it just pushes the mythology 
of aliens and alien visitation forward. So it just basically appeared on the web in 2005, and it's been there ever since. And if it's a hoax, again, nobody's taking credit for the hoax, which is kind of weird after 12. You know, I, personally, me, if I put that much time in something and fooled the entire world, I'd probably let them know at some point and take credit for it. But. Ryan wants to know, what is your favorite UFO story? And he also wants to know mine. I want to hear yours first. My favorite UFO story is, uh, you know, immediately I flash to this. It's the things that terrified me as a kid. And when I read the story of Betty and Barney Hill's encounter, Bingo. Uh, the interrupted journey, yep. that that is the classic to me. It's a classic to me because I don't believe there's any way those people are lying about what happened to them. And, you know, there's criticism of the hypno hypnotic regression, but the doctor who did it was very good at it and, and didn't lead them by suggestion, I don't think, from the transcripts I read. And, and um, you know, to me, I think that that's, uh, that's the best one for sure. Yeah, and uh, it, that was one of my first two as well, and and I talk about it enough on the show. But also the Andreessen affair um, was a uh, was pretty epic too as well. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I, I gotta I gotta go with uh, Betty and Barney Hill. That's kind of interesting. Yeah. I um, uh, the the interrupted journey, the way that Fowler wrote it. Let's not we can't discount him too. The way that it was written was uh was really well done and you know it, it had movie written all over it and of course that happened and it was, yeah great and that's a great movie by the way if you can find movie. that online or somewhere folks absolutely watch the film the film is an excellent representation of what happened it really is good. it is totally okay now, you know what you know wait a minute i want to can i throw out number two there also number sure. two for me would be the 1973 pascagoula incident where the two the, guys out fishing are abducted by the weird buzzing robots that Freaked me out as a kid, and I've never gotten over that one. Billy, Billy, Bo Bob, and uh, yeah, 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 Charlie, Charlie, and yeah, Billy, yeah. or something. That one, that one was really, um, that one really got me. You know and, what? Oh, oh, and the aliens that attacked the family in Kentucky. That that was creepy. Yeah, that so was, I actually have three. Yeah, that's those are, those are all good. You know what's funny about the uh, Louisiana swamp incident? For those mm -hmm. that don't know, that was front page friggin' news, man, for about a month. Yeah. That was yeah, it was <laughs> that was big time UFO stuff. And what 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 added to the creepy part about that at that time, it was uh, The Exorcist was probably the number one movie right in the country. Yeah. So the country's yeah. freaking out. Um, you had uh, uh, I was uh, I had the next incident I was just going to mention. Uh, oh, well, chari you know, chariots! Was, uh, chariots of the gods was yes. was out. Huge, yeah, it was huge, and so the country was in this. Well, the, and the film there was a film out called "In Search of Ancient Astronauts," which is when I first saw uh, Eric Van Daniken's ideas and got Chariots of the Gods. Too. Yeah, so, so the yeah. country was on full paranormal watch. And, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and so when that Louisiana thing hit, man, it didn't go away for a while. Well, they were on, on Dick Cavett. I mean, I, people don't know, you know, in late night talk shows, you had Johnny Carson, who was the equivalent of who's on Jimmy Fallon now. Right. Um, you had you had him on on the air and you had on ABC you had Dick Cavett, who was this sort of pointy headed intellectual New Yorker that didn't buy into this stuff kind of thing. He was very, very you know dry. And, um, you know, he went on, they, they went on their, his show and told the story. And so it, that was huge. I mean, and back then you only had what, five, five networks, five channels, 13 right. channels, three networks. Right. So it was a big deal. It was absolutely a big deal. It would be like, it, it would be like if you got your own, you know, special on, on Fox or something or CBS today. Did you know that Seth Rogen has a late night talk show? I had no idea. No, I did not yeah. know that. Yeah. One now the I know. Yeah, Seth Rogen, or is it Joe Rogan? Or is oh, it's it, Joe Rogan. Or yeah. Is it, <laughs> or is it Jonah Hill? I mean, one of them has got a late night talk no. show. No. Yeah, and they wow. ban they ban Trump from the show, but that's a whole other thing. Oh, whoever, what? <laughs> Seth I'm Rogan. Sure, somebody's I'm sure got, the Donald's really sweating that one. Yeah, somebody's got a late night talk show I've never heard of. So now, okay, now that we've gotten Betty and Barney Hill out of the way. Um, <clears throat> Let's talk about contact in the desert. Um, okay. I know, I know, 
uh, you heard uh, the next day about, or maybe you even heard about them that night, about the sightings that were going on there. And it was, all, all things considered, a true mass sighting. There was uh, hundreds and hundreds of people that saw and videotaped and, and shot it. Um, and then you heard about it the next day. When you started to hear the stories floating around Joshua Tree, what were you thinking? Well, the first thing I thought was there's a, a military combined forces weapons training facility just over the hill. Uh, so that's the first thing I thought, to be honest with you. That was the first thing that crossed my mind. And, um, you know, maybe they're out testing some weird spacecraft out there. Although, typically, if it's super secret technology, you are not going to test it uh, around people. And certainly not when there's a major UFO conference going on. Um, and, you know, I, I mean, I tend to think that these things are misidentifications. I mean, I'm pretty pretty good with my aviation stuff. I can pretty much tell you everything that's in the air. I can I can distinguish between aircraft types pretty easily. Um, but on Saturday, was it Saturday or Sunday? It was Sunday, Saturday, I guess. Saturday was the You're, mass sighting. Sunday was the sightings uh, that you and I had. Right. And, you know, I mean, I will say this, that, that uh, Dolan and I, Richard Dolan and I, were looking through the night vision um, binoculars, and there was this one object that went across the sky, and it was just a a strobe, but it was a very slow strobe. And I'll be honest with you, Jimmy, I, I've never seen an aviation strobe light like that. They're they're much faster than that. And it made no sense to me because it, it appeared to be, you know, it moved in a straight line, which makes me think it's an aircraft, right? But it was it, it was apparently a very high altitude. It pulsated very slowly and it i've never throbbed. seen a light like that it yeah, throbbed. throbbed. yeah thank you yeah. yeah it was throbbing it was well throbbing. i saw it if you remember i saw it first right right and then right. dolan grabbed the night vision from me and and i know which i never got back by the way <laughs> yeah right <laughs> and well. and you and richard and i were standing there and to hear richard's descriptions of it right which was interesting because he was seeing the same things that you were eventually going to see that I just saw that it just didn't look right. It just didn't no. look, didn't, didn't look right. And you, Mr. Aviation. Uh, I know my engineer. planes, man. And right. it wasn't anything that I could say was normal. So I don't know what the heck it was. To hear, but, to hear Dolan drop WTF about 20 times in a row was a pretty mm -hmm. cool, uh, you know, because that's what it was. I mean, and, and the other thing, okay, so let, no, let's back up. Let's back up. When uh, the evening started, uh, it was still daylight out, and and I stood up in front of you and Richard, and you know we have our friends there, and I'm telling mm -hmm. you and Richard about what I saw the night before, and I know how incredible that sounds, you know, to have Mars or uh, something that you think is a planet in the sky move. Yeah, and Mars was incredible that night. It was phenomenal, right. and anyway. to see it, to see it move and disappear. That's what I saw. And Richard said, you know, I'm jealous that I didn't get to see that. Your What was funny was your immediate thing was, Jimmy, 29 Palms is right down the street, man. Come on. Right. And my right. response to you was, dude, I saw what I saw. And it wasn't anything like it was a planet. It was something that you would look up in the sky and, you know, identify as a star or a bright planet. Move and disappear. That's what I saw. Mm -hmm. I, and and we all look to the skies every day. You wanted to go pragmatic on me. And I get that. I understand. But you weren't there. And then you started to see the other stuff on Sunday night. What now, what makes you, do you kind of understand what everybody was trying to describe the night before? This stuff was actually <laughs> going on. Yeah, I do. And that the pulsating motion was, was weird. Um, but again, if it's a straight line trajectory, I tend to think it's an airplane at high altitude, but I can't account for the, the, the way the light functioned. I just, I can't. So, I, I mean, I know my stuff. I know my aviation stuff. And, I, you know, Jimmy, I don't know what it was. I will just say that I believe you that you saw something really weird and that you're able to distinguish between normal and weird. <laughs> it was trippy, man. Yeah, you know, I, and it's weird. You know, I mean, I've had two legitimate sites uh, sightings. I think both of them uh, involving the show I was on, uncovering aliens. Both of them occurring around that. And um, it, it once you realize you're seeing something you can't explain, especially when you know, I think I can explain pretty much everything. It's it's freaky. It's like, okay, well, what, what ours is it theirs? Um, 
where did it come from? Doesn't it gives you a weird feeling? It gives you a feeling that this stuff isn't just a game that we're talking about. It's definitely for real. And what do you do with the the person that wasn't there? You know, uh, that's on the other side of the world, right? And they read the reports about what's happened. And they come back with, come on, man, it's a mass hallucination or it's a satellite. You got, you guys don't know what you're looking at. I know what I'm talking about. You guys are. You are yeah. Are, satellites do you, don't, yeah. don't pulsate for well, one thing. They, they don't throb. Um, this and they is really don't, getting dirty, this whole conversation, by the way. Well, yeah. Um, so, and, you know, uh, you just tell them you had to be there. You know, you really do have to be there. It's, it's kind of like you have to have the experience. And th the thing is, in a group that large, what do we have? Like maybe 20 people there yep. um, or more. Somebody is going to figure out what it is if it's not something um, if it's something normal. And nobody could. No, and everybody there is smart. First off, the, the, you know, yeah. it's the fader knots. Number one, number two, you and Dolan are not exactly two uneducated guys. And We're not dumb. No, 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 no. And I thought it was really cool that we were all able to witness that together and see the exact same thing and come to the exact same conclusions. That just wasn't right. Yeah, and the conclusion is this thing is too it's too weird. It's not the weirdest thing I've ever seen, but it's in the top three. And it's weird enough for me to say I can't I positively identify it as anything terrestrial. Now, what do you do now? Uh, you've had a couple of weeks to deal with this, and, and myself included. When you hear people talk about night vision and the ability to see this stuff that you're not that you don't normally see, that I think all of us you know, didn't have problems with their accounts, but it just seemed too good to be true. You know, now when somebody says they're out there with night vision and they've seen something, what do you think? Well, I mean, I think I, for me, that all turned when I went up with Melinda Leslie up to the up above Gerald, um, Arizona, when we were shooting Uncovering Aliens and these three <laughs> spacecraft appear in a triangle formation right after Stephen Jones says, you know, show yourselves to us if you're out there. And then they appear um, that when I saw that and looked at the night vision footage, I mean, for me, it went over the top because, again, it was well past sundown. It was several hours past sundown. There's no way at that latitude we would have been able to see satellites at that point. They wouldn't have been illuminated. They're self-luminous. I mean, you throw in all the different things that just say you just saw something you can't explain. And, and, and having had that experience, when I hear the night vision stuff, I absolutely do not discount it. I absolutely take it seriously at this point. Now, and by the way, Maureen, on our, on our Gerald sighting, Maureen Ellsbury went through and, and looked in the satellite database, and there was nothing in the sky that could have accounted. For well, that stuff. And, and satellites, look, I don't care what any expert says. I'm telling you right now, satellites don't play bumper pool. Okay, and and we're yeah. <laughs> and if if they did, we would have all kinds of footage of that, and you could walk out in your backyard every day and see satellites zipping around up there. They don't do that. They quite simply mm -hmm. don't do what I saw. Now, let me let me ask you this: the other object that I saw, which was the green chrome ball thing right mm -hmm. call it an orb i orb is the wrong word but because this was physical i could see the, the shape of it uh, it wasn't glowing i mean it was slightly glowing what i mean is it wasn't just a, a bright light this was something that had you know a shape to it um right and, and it takes off you know from ground level uh relatively ground level i probably saw it a quarter mile off of the ground but it takes off up into the atmosphere um and uh, i track it for three four five minutes it goes up stops and then turns left and shoots out and disappears into the stars now when i and you've heard me describe this to you in person uh i've just, just mm -hmm. it was nothing more nothing less than what i just described to you except for it was hauling balls i mean it was it was moving <laughs> And, okay. and 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 uh, there's no other way to describe it, you know. Yes, but, thank you for that e eloquent description, James. Yes, thank yes. You. And and so and and then to turn left uh, to stop, and then turn left when it is obviously at I don't know sixty thousand, hundred thousand feet. It's like out right. of the atmosphere now. And to, when you hear a description like that, is it us? Is it them? 
or is it us using their technology? Because if it's us using their technology, to me, I think that's a bigger story than if it's just E.T. Because <laughs> E.T. is a simple answer. Okay, they're here. Right. Okay, all right. No, no big deal. They're here. But if it's a technology that we don't know anything about that our government is holding back from us, anti-gravity, free energy, something without a rocket engine, there was no flames coming off of this. Mm -hmm. You know, it was a technology that literally shot up into the heavens and turned left. Uh, what What do you think? Is it us, them, or is it us with their technology? What do you think I saw? Well, a lot of it has to do with the shape. I mean, to me, the, my rule is generally if it if it's shaped like a disc, it's one of theirs. If it's shaped like a Dorito, it's one of ours. That's my standard response. But um, without seeing that, I can't really tell you. And I don't know of anything that is the triangular shape that goes straight up like that. I mean, most it's a disc shaped stuff. So I tend to think it's one of theirs. But again, I, I can't tell you, Jimmy, it's because because I think the lines are totally blurred because I do believe that we developed working anti-gravity technology sometime around around 1960. And uh, we we've been able to exploit that and actually make saucer technology. So I, I can't tell you, honestly, I, I would have to have seen it myself. And even then, I, I would say, go with your gut feeling. What does your gut feeling tell you? Was it one of theirs or one of ours? Oh, man, I, I have no clue. I, I really don't. I was so freaked out by the whole experience because it was something that I had never seen before. So my brain, I, it just didn't work for me. You know, I, I could not say, you know, it was like the first time, you know what, Mike, the first time I was at the Indy 500 and I was standing, mm -hmm. in, I was standing in turn one and the, and I'm watching cars all day long. Uh, uh, it was a practice day and I'm watching the cars do 55 miles an hour. And, and this is in 72, right? 73. And the first time I saw a car shoot out of the fourth turn coming down the straightaway at 220 miles an hour. OK, I, mm -hmm. I did not compute what I was seeing. It was it was insanity. And it was yeah. kind of like that moment. I you I've never seen anything like I, I just can't I can't I, I can't describe it any more than what I've said, you know. And for me to say a green chrome ball from two miles away, if I can see a green chrome ball shape from two, three miles away, four miles, whatever it was, it yeah. was obviously big. Now, mm -hmm. it doesn't make any sense that right there, I sound like the crazy guy. But that's what I saw, you know? And yeah. The, and the other thing that we are all used to, um, yourself, any anybody, we're all used to seeing planes in the air. And there's certain things that you identify with the plane immediately. Number one is wings. Number two is sound. Number three is speed. You know how fast, you know, you know what to expect in the atmosphere when you see you a You got plane a red going. light and a green light and a strobe and all, a white strobe. Maybe. All of yeah. that. And you're used to uh, all of those natural things because you see them every single day. And then when you see something without any of that and no, uh, no afterburners, no flames, no sparks, nothing like like that no noise no wings nothing projecting this thing forward not a helicopter rotor nothing nothing tied to it that you would normally see but yet it looks like something being shot out of a roman candle or something you know and it's just just hauling you know and going mm -hmm. up and it's a green ball from that distance it's just got size to it you know, and you know what the other really weird thing that I, I found bizarre, and I saw this maybe maybe about five times in the five minutes that I saw it. Everybody was shooting lasers at it. And these industrial military grade lasers, right? These big lasers. Yeah, yeah, the know. green ones, yeah. Yeah, and they were like half inch diameter laser beams, you know, just huge. Not the little tiny office red laser that you chase your cat around with i think you know these massive <laughs> lasers anyway so um the odds of the laser because of the craft's speed you know what i gotta take a break here but the the odds of the laser touching the craft are rare you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's mm -hmm. impossible to do. But once in a while, it did cross, you know, it would 
across the and when it did it would sparkle and i could see it in the uh in the night vision this sparkly thing that happened when it would hit the orb because i saw it as being chrome and just imagine a laser hitting you know it was a metallic ball it was just a green yeah. Chrome you could say so you could see the actual physical structure of this thing. Yeah, yeah. Hey, Mike, I'm going to get you to hang on, and I want to take some phone calls. 323-825-5045. This is Fade to Black. Our guest tonight, Mike Barra. I'm going to make him stay and take some phone calls. 323-825-5045. This is Fade, Fade to Black on the Game Changer Network and KGRA, the planet. 323-825-5045. We'll be right back. Listen to my boy, Jimmy Church, on JimmyChurchRadio.com. Despite popular opinion, reading a book will not make you smarter. But listening to Jimmy Church will. Does your basement or crawl space have a damp, musty smell? Well, watch out. That's a sign of too much moisture and not enough ventilation. And that can mean increased mold growth and the buildup of harmful toxins and gases. Don't bother with a dehumidifier. It just circulates the same unhealthy air. Now there's a better way to remove these dangers and odors. It's with the computerized wave ventilation unit that reduces moisture and expels pollutants. We replaced our old dehumidifier with the wave unit, and in only three weeks, our basement is dry and the musty smell is is gone. Wave ventilation requires no maintenance, no buckets of water or filters, and costs only pennies a day to run. Breathe better, live healthier with an affordable, no maintenance wave ventilation unit. Call 888-618-WAVE 888-618-WAVE or visit MyDryHome.com MyDryHome.com Ride the wave Wave home solutions for a healthy, comfortable home What's up, Fader Knots? Studio Dumb loves Fade to Black and the F2B audience so much that they have put together the ultimate stereo Bluetooth system. They've done it just for you. Man, check this out. The Studio Dome SBB2 stereo system is here. It's featuring two Studio Boombox 2 SBB2 wireless Bluetooth speakers packed in its own custom hard shell case. This Studio Dome system features the very latest in stereo Bluetooth technology. The two full-range boomboxes are in true wireless stereo. You've got to hear this. It's amazing. It's just $129, and use the promo code JCRTWS, and you'll also get free shipping. It's simple. Just go to JimmyChurchRadio.com, click on the Studio Dome banner, go back Lee Tepe. It's not a lifestyle we chose. We were born this way. KGRARadio.com This is KJCR at JimmyChurchRadio.com Welcome back to Fade to Black. Mike Barra, our good friend. It's been way too long since he's been on the show. Great conversation tonight. 323-825-5045. The phone lines are officially open. 323-825-5045. Now, Mike, um, you and I were talking earlier today, and we had decided to keep politics off of the table. And we are. Okay, I'm not going there. But okay. it seems to be, and we don't even have to name names, but it seems to be the year of UFO talk in this political run. I've never heard it like this before, and I know that you have not either. Um, is, and that, that foul word of disclosure, 
Is there is there something going on right now? Do you think? Do you feel like there's something that that we actually might turn the corner? Especially after something like CITD, which could have, you know, that could have very well just happened over Los Angeles. It just happened, you know, over the city of Joshua Tree, which is not a small town. I mean, there's a lot of people that live there and there were a lot of witnesses, uh, you know, uh, to those events. But imagine if that happened over New York or Chicago or Miami or San Francisco. Uh, yeah. Well, you'd have to be looking for it, though. I mean, you guys are kind of out there looking. And, and that's the thing is it wasn't like a big, you know, uh, gigantic Independence Day mothership came over and floated slowly over the entire place when there was thousands of people to witness it. At. That's a little different. But it was pretty, you know, it was pretty impressive. I, I don't know, Jimmy. I mean, these, this political stuff. It's happened before. People have brought this up. They've talked about it. Uh, it's never really gone anywhere. I don't really feel like it's going to go anywhere this time. When you talk about disclosure, every to me, what I jump to, and actually, you know, um, Richard Dolan and I were talking about this on our panel, one of the panels we did. It's like when I when you say the word disclosure, I think of the Steve Bassett, very public presidential speech from the Oval Office, telling us there's aliens. I don't see that ever happening, but. It could just be that the aliens get more and more aggressive and we start seeing stuff more and more. Um, but I don't, you know, I no, honestly, I don't feel like anything really big is going to happen in terms of, of extraterrestrials this year. Although we are, I've argued this for five or six years now, we're in the middle of an apocalypse, meaning that the veil is being lifted on things. And aliens is one of those things that the veil is going to be lifted on. So it may be that, that what happens is that we actually get more and more sightings to the point that people just can't deny it anymore, no matter what the government says. Why Why make it an issue? Why make it a public issue? Is it really to get votes? Is it? Yeah, I, that's what I think. I mean, you know, the people that, that – uh, well, first of all, I think Podesta is really – is legitimately interested in this subject. Um, Hillary, you know, I, I – I tend to be very cynical about about uh, her motivations, but you know, you, you never know. If Podesta's chief of staff and making policy, and you know, we, you never know something might happen. But I, I kind of tend to think not. We'll, we'll see. I wanted to. I mean, first of all, first of all, we got to we got to get through the election and see who wins. And frankly, I think we're going to go through a lot of chaos in the next six months. I mean, right now, Britain's on the verge of voting whether to stay in the European Union or not. I hope they leave. I think they're going to leave. And if they do leave, that's going to set off a whole chain of events that are going to really, I think, shift the ground under our feet and make us all pretty uncomfortable for, for a while. Ah, you're wrong there. I'll make a prediction right now. Britain stays. Oh. Britain well, stays. Well, I, I mean, the question is, does Britain vote to stay or do they vote to leave and the the vote gets suppressed and and faked and then is there stuff going on in the streets? I mean, I don't know. We'll have to wait and see how it all goes down. But No, uh, they're not going to leave. They're not going to okay. leave. They are. Okay. The vote is going to go the other way. There's no. There's. They're. They're not. It's not going to happen. It's. It's not. I'm telling you right now. It's not going to happen. There's no way Great Britain is separating from the EU. It is not going to happen. Okay. That's like. We'll... That's like. What was it? What was it last year? Scotland, right? Yeah. Yeah, whether they were going to leave. But the thing is, Jimmy, is these things keep coming up for votes. So that, so what's building is this momentum of separatism, this momentum of breaking down the established hierarchies that we have. And, and I think you're seeing that energy in the U.S. I mean, I did talk about it in The Choice back in 2010. And I think that this is this if it doesn't happen this year, these this mo the momentum for this kind of stuff to break apart our old alliances and make new ones, I just think is going to build over the next few years. Nah, I, I just, yeah, that that's possible. But as far as Britain, I mean, look, first off, it's Britain is probably the most important part of the EU. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's not, let's, you know, love France, love Spain, love Germany. I get all of that. Holland. I, I, I understand. I understand all of that before anybody says anything. Italy, I get that, but but there's just no, there is no EU without Britain, and yeah, and they're only as strong as each other, and there, that's just it. It ain't gonna happen. It's not going to happen. I swear, I swear. I'll make a bet with you right now. I'll make a bet. What what do you want to bet? Let's put something well, on the table. Uh, well, I'm not 100 percent convinced it's gonna happen either. I'm just saying I think it's a possibility. But let's bet something. Let's bet I don't know, a steak dinner somewhere. 
Okay. The LA restaurant of your choice and sometime in the next six months or a year. Let's okay. do it that way. Okay. All right. Okay. Fair enough. All right. And uh, we'll see who gets to collect in a couple days. Okay. All right. Fair enough. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. Let's uh let's go to the phones. Hi, you're live on Fade to Black. Oh, it's Dino, Mike Barra's favorite. Hey Dino. Hello oh, yeah. there. Well, hey, I want to tell you something with just a little bit about politics here. Uh, you know, it would be a disaster if Britain uh, left that. But the thing we really have to worry oh, about I, here yeah. in the USA was the Trans-Pacific Partnership. No one can even read that thing. And I yelled at my uh, congressman at the uh, Memorial Day parade, and he said he agreed with me. They're going to vote that down because that would take, you know, free trade is necessary in the planet and between countries, but not the kind of thing that, that they're going to rip us off in that. Uh, okay. I, I I agree, and I don't think it would be a disaster. I mean, it would be a disaster for the EU if Britain leaves, although the Germans are very, very rich and very powerful, but I don't think it would be a disaster for the English people or for Britain. I think it would be the best thing that could possibly happen to them. They could get their country and their culture back, and, and I just think there's going to be a, a rush in that direction in, in, the, well, in the future. I, it's possible, but but like I said, the EU is the EU, and, and right now that doesn't need to be uh, destabilized. But, you know, Jimmy, it's crazy. I was in London a few years ago, just a couple years ago, and, you know, I've been there several times over, over my lifetime, and the best thing about England is you go to London, and every pub, every street corner restaurant brewed their own English bitter brew, and it was fantastic, and you could sample all these different ales from, you know, all these different places in england that made their own beer and you go and i went over there and all i could get was corona and budweiser and heineken same crap i get over here so to me it's like there's a there's a loss of the individual cultures of these countries that is well, well, i think kind of tragic well yeah but just like any any place else uh the you want something that's different so i can understand you know corona after drinking dark delicious British beer, beer you know? bitter, yeah. I, I, I mean, you know, I, mean, I just there's nothing I better. was so looking forward to that, and I just, I everywhere I went, all I had was American beers or Mexican beers, and I'm like, seriously? Yeah. So the corporations have kind of taken over and homogenized the world. It's starting to, it's starting to get everywhere, and that's just, that's disappointing. You know, me. I had read, uh, and I know Dino called him, but um, I had read, this is crazy, uh, the number one import. Be, uh, the number one beer in Russia, mm -hmm. Budweiser. Yeah, right? well, you know, here's like, the what? thing, though. You, you <laughs> and I remember Bud from back in the day when it was, you know, we, we called it names that started with the letter P, okay? It didn't yes. taste very good. But I actually, uh, when I was in Philadelphia for the MUFON, uh, MUFON co conference last year, I had uh, a girlfriend, a girl that was there, bought me a, a Bud, and I drank it and it's way better than it was I, they've changed the formula or something so don't give budweiser such a short shrift of it right now it's getting better it's better I beer than no, it used i have to. no clue i have not had an american beer of any kind and i'll say it right yeah. now in let's see this is 2016 i'm gonna go uh 30 years 1985 was probably the last time that uh, 84 Okay, so the bet is now a steak and a Budweiser, so we really have to try one, uh, oh, right? God. Oh, no. <laughs> well, no, Jimmy, I mean, if I might, on tonight's topic, the only reason I brought, I even addressed the political situation is because I do believe the 1% of 1% uh, are not only living high off the hog, but they're using all this extra money from all this world trade and all this banking control in our country and around the world, the Rothschild, et cetera, to fund things like the secret space program. And I mm -hmm. must say that uh, up in uh, up at the Life Expo uh, that I did stay to watch one of Barra's um, presentations. And, you know, it's a pretty interesting presentation. I would like to see more um, uh, definite, uh, you know, documentation and such. And I would like to know where the what the black triangles are. And I would like to know the the cigar shaped ships if they belong to a secret space program. What else? What's new? What else have we learned about them? What else could be disclosed about them? Now we've been talking about this for about ten years. What did I just What did I just tell you that we just saw a contact in the desert? Well, but is that but there was there was, there was a light, a form, I and mean, was that one of ours or one of theirs? The people I know that have talked about this have seen cigar-shaped things that look like giant aircraft carriers, but they're in space. What do you know about that, Mike? Well, uh, there there were triangular um, 
aircraft that were seen. Uh, in fact, I think um, one of the coast to coast hosts had a sighting of one big triangular ship that went over him in the desert. And those were commonly believed at the time in the 1990s to be helicopter carriers, that they actually were large airships that carried fleets of helicopters. And there, there was military applications of that. Now, other triangular shaped craft that I've seen or worked on, I, I worked briefly on the A-12 uh, project with the A-12 bomber, which was uh, which was shaped like a triangle. We used to we nicknamed it the Dorito because it looked like a Dorito, and it was canceled by Dick Cheney in 1991 because it was overweight and over budget. And you know my answer to that was that's how you know it's an airplane if it's overweight and over budget. Um, so I know that these craft exist and they've existed for a long time. It's an ideal stealthy kind of a shape, and I tend to think if it's triangular that they're our craft. But again, like you say. The documentation is difficult to come by. It's difficult to get governments to admit what their secret space programs and spacecraft look like. We know they've got them. We know they've had experimental craft. They kept the B-2 and the stealth fighter secret for years. So there's no question they've got some other stuff out there. But putting your finger on it, that's why I'm writing this book, because now I'm going to dig, and now I'm going to try to find out what these things yeah, really Mike, are. Yeah, Mike, that was my, my other something. question about uh, – I've never heard you address how our secrets kept so well – and I fear that this goes back into the politics that if at this point it's not even our tax money as much as drug money from around the world and probably horrible things like prostitution and child slavery. Mm -hmm. That maybe that that's how the, the one percent of the one percent get the money to fund these things. Well, how the secrets are kept is that the lie is different at every level. Every person involved in the conspiracy is told a different lie by the person above him. And so he thinks he knows what the secret is. So he keeps his secret. Mm -hmm. So if anything does get out, it's a lie. And it can later be proven to be a lie because somebody else knows another story and knows that he was told a lie. That's how it's done. And, and the other way to do this is to keep the, the circle of people involved relatively or very, very small. And I think that that's part of how this has worked. Like, you know, the stuff I learned about NASA and the Freemasons and the things that they did on the moon and Buzz Aldrin performing this Masonic ceremony in the lunar module. You know, again, it's all it's all just taking fact A, fact B, fact C. You put them together and you realize that there is a pattern and that there is something going on and there was a conspiracy. But how, that's how it's done and that's how compartment, compartmentalization works. You know, there were people on TWA 800, which like I told you earlier is what got me started as a conspiracy theorist. And it was all compartmentalized. People were doing tests for certain specific chemicals without being told that those chemicals were the residue of bomb or missile warhead detonations. So in other words, they would come back with a result, but they were never able to put that result in any context and go, oh my God, this means a missile hit the plane, not that some spark ignited the fuel tank, which is the most ridiculous story I've ever heard in my life. Yeah. Well, at contact in the desert uh, last year, I was able by Skype to talk to Edgar Mitchell before he passed on. And mm -hmm. what I had asked him was, you know, you've known a lot of things, and you've been you were in some, you know, government, uh, uh, you know, oath keeping type of things. Not oath, but you know, secret keeping, some top secret. I said, now, are you ever? I said, after uh, after you're here, are you ever going or before going to release any of the top secret oaths you've been sworn to? And he said, no. He said, I will keep them. And I'm wondering if he knew anything else that he didn't tell us, and whether he left those secrets with family members or whether he was that loyal to his oath that he kept them. And I asked the same thing in person, one-on-one, -on -one of um, who, who's the, the British uh, minister guy, a uh, little guy. Uh, Nick, Nick Pope. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Nick was, I was surprised. I thought he was going to be stiff upper lip, but both at his presentation and then later when I saw him walking around the grounds, I approached him personally, and he wasn't afraid. I thought he was going to shy away. And I said, you must know some secret okay. stuff hey, that Dino, you can't talk Dino, about. And Dino, he said, yeah, I can't talk about it. Dino, we're going to run out of time. Hold on. Uh, put Nick, Bo Nick Pope off to the side. Edgar Mitchell. Mike, you want to address that? And uh, that my my answer is he's got boatloads of stuff he can't talk about and probably 99 percent of it have nothing to do with et yeah ed was a, a 33rd degree scottish right freemason that's one of the reasons so many astronauts were freemasons one of the reasons for that was because that way they knew that they were working with guys that could keep a secret so he definitely had secrets and he had an agenda 
And he wanted people to believe in UFOs and Roswell. But when you started, started talking about, did you see anything up there? Were there any extraterrestrial ruins or anything on the moon? You know, he said no. So to me, I've always been suspicious of the fact that he wanted the people to believe in the thing that was really, really hard to prove. But he didn't want them to believe in the thing that could be proven if the astronauts admitted what they saw. And that was corroborated by images, which could have been done with that. So I just found that fascinating. And I think I think Ed held some secrets that. Sure. That we'll never know. We'll never know. Thank you for the call, Dino. Uh, let's go. Let's go back to the phones. Hi, you're live on Fade to Black. Hey, Jimmy. It's Kevin from New San Luis. Hey, how are you, man? Really quick before we run out of time, what do you got for Mike? I wanted. I uh, wanted his thoughts on Tom DeLonge's Secret Machines project. Ah, great! I, I can't believe we didn't bring up DeLonge tonight. Thank you so much for the call. We'll get right to it. Well, I don't know yeah. much about it. I don't know much about it. I've just recently found out who the hell Tom DeLong is. I guess he was the singer for Blink-182, yep. a band, right? And yep. I really don't know them. I don't know of him. I had begun to hear about him through um, uh, Jason. Um, the guy who was on Hangar 1. He used to work with Maureen Ellsbury. Um, Jason McClellan. Yes. And he's working with them. And uh, I guess he's a guy that's got some money and he started the new project. And I, a little bit about UFOs. I don't know anything about it at this point, but I wish him all the best, is all I can say about it. Well, what, what's interesting about DeLong is that he says he quit the band. He quit the band and, and everything else uh, <laughs> because. <laughs> Uh, he, I'm he, sorry. Uh, just okay. All yeah, right. Yeah. No, hey, man. He gave up. He gave up his. I just, I just flashed onto the scene in um in you know Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy where they meet the rock star in the bar who's spending a year dead for tax purposes and and they said, the guy said you, you told us you were willing to wait to be famous and we didn't think you'd have the option. I don't. I don't know the gentleman. I understand he's interested in the topic. I don't mean to slag on it, but I don't know anything about it. And I, and if he's committed to it and dedicated, let's. Let's go see what he's got. I no, he's – if you go back, Mike, what you should do, and especially after the show tonight, is is just go back and look <laughs> at some of his statements that he has made over the last three or four years. Okay. Uh, and, is he on Twitter? I, I, I assume he's on Twitter, right? Yeah. No. Okay. Uh, but, but no, articles and, and interviews and other things. Blink-182 is one of the biggest bands in the world, number one. Number two, he's walked away from okay. a, cu- a couple of hundred million dollars of future money for sure. Sure. Oh, okay. And, okay. And and they are of that status. Now, for him to be the front man of, of one of the biggest acts in the world, to walk away from that because he says he is dealing with a national security issue. That's his quote. And he has oh. taken all of his money. And, uh, of course, not only has he written a book but and started a website, but he's starting a movement, not only for disclosure, that's that's part of it, but also what other people know out there. And he is throwing all of his resources at this. This is not this is not some guy, uh, you know, from a strip band in Hollywood. This is this is a guy with <laughs> not, that, not that we're going to slag off on them either. No, no, are, I'm but, not. I'm not. No, no, I'm, but I'm okay, saying no, that no. this, you know, this is a guy like anybody else that you could name that's fronting a big band around the world. And he's walked okay. away from it for for the UFO issue. It's very interesting. One of the so for me, it would it would be like if Xander from Cheap Trick was suddenly behind UFOs, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, well, uh, maybe. Yeah, you got to give Tom another. 10 okay, no, years. I, I, you know, it's great. I, obviously, it's something I got to dig into, and it is actually something I've heard about that I've been meaning to dig into. I just, I just don't know much about it. Yeah, he uh, he he tells he he goes out to uh, Area Fifty One. I'm gonna I'm gonna give you the abridged version of the story. And he's camping with some friends. He's got a tent, and he's out at Area Fifty One. And he wakes up in the morning. Something's going on. He goes out, dude. And there's a flying saucer above his tent. And and there's more to the story than just that. But, mm-hmm. but there you go. And he's just well. Going. I mean, Jimmy, these experiences are life changing. I mean, I I had always wanted to see a UFO. I never did. But then we we're we we're doing, you know, um, uncovering aliens in New York. I had a sighting when we were doing the sizzle reel, and then in, in um, Sedona. So it's like once you see that, it, it it's like holy crap, this stuff is actually real. And once you realize it's real, it, it is when it really gets to you, and it it does change you. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, Mike, thank you so much, my brother. Loved it. Thank you. Talk to you soon. Take care. Mike Bear, everybody, went to the bloody end tonight. And his website, of course, is mikebearer.blogspot.com.
And uh, yeah, DeLong uh, just recently said uh, that uh, Blink-182's upcoming album, California, is going to be without him. And as we know, after parting ways with the band, he has kept busy not only releasing some music, but he released a book about the threat of UFOs. And he went on to say, and this was released today, that he quit Blink-182 to focus on a, and I'm quoting here, national security issues, specifically UFOs, dealing with extraterrestrial dangers and the grind of touring with the band was too much for him to take. Yeah, it's a pretty extraordinary position for him uh, to uh, put himself in, but that's uh, that's where we're at right now. And I'll check this out. I got to get this in. You're not going to believe this. The latest entrant into the space race, are you ready, has a wingspan Longer than the distance traveled by the Wright brothers. Its landing gear has a total of 28 wheels and special construction permits for the scaffolding needed to build what will be the world's largest airplane. And I'm talking about the one and only Paul Allen. That's right. The billionaire co-founder of Microsoft owner of the Seattle Seahawks, and I think he's got a couple of Jimi Hendrix's guitars, too. He's building it right now. If you want to see the pictures of it, go to our Facebook page for Jimmy Church Radio. Just got posted. It's a twin fuselage giant as wide as a football field that, when fully loaded, is going to weigh one point. 3 million pounds. It's going to be powered by six 747 engines and have 60 miles of wiring. It's called the Straddle Launch. The plane is going to be bigger than Howard Hughes's Spruce Goose, which flew once, by the way, in 1947. Yeah. It's called Allen's Vulcan Aerospace, and it's going to carry a rocket strapped to its belly to an altitude of about 35,000 feet. And then once aloft, the rocket out into air, uh, it's going to be an air launch orbit. Paul Allen, you should see the wings on this thing. Now, also, British astronaut Tim Peake says that he is experiencing the world's worst hangover after spending six months in space. Now back on Earth at the European Astronaut Center in Cologne, Germany, he faces three weeks of rehab during which he will undergo a barrage of medical tests and maintain a strict exercise regime. After arriving in Cologne, Peake said that he was experiencing dizziness and vertigo every time he moved his head. Such effects normally disappear very quickly. Others, you know, take a little longer to recover. but And some are permanent changes. But most of it is cured with a Bloody Mary the next morning. There you go. All right. Let's see. I had one other thing I needed to uh, get into. Oh, really quick. I didn't want to touch upon this or go too deep. But... The United States Supreme Court declined to hear a challenge to laws in two states that restrict ownership of semi-automatic firearms. Today, justices rejected an appeal of an October decision by the U.S. US Circuit Court of Appeals, which upheld laws in Connecticut and New York that prohibit civilians from owning certain semi-automatic rifles and high-capacity magazines. The laws bar access to the same gun used by Omar Mateen, the man who killed 49 people, wounded 53 others in that terrorist attack in the Orlando nightclub. That's it. We're out of here. This is Fade to Black. Thank you, Mike Barra. Tomorrow night, don't forget, right here, William Henry, and we are going to discuss the ascension of Mary Magdalene. Fade to Black's executive producer is Rita Kamarian. Show is produced by Hilton J. Palm, Mark D. Kovar. Thank you, LJ3, Renee, Mark Dunbar, Jonas, Dennis, and Bob. Announcers are Steve Harder, Gene Vitoa, Mark D. Kovar. Fady by Dale. Webmaster is Drew the Geek. Music, Doug Aldridge. Intro, Space Boy. Fade to Black is produced by KJCR for the Game Changer Network. Syndication, KGRA, The Planet. Thank you to everyone who called in tonight. Thank you, Mike Barra. 
This broadcast is only copyrighted 2016 by Faded Black and the Game Changer Network. It cannot be rebroadcast, downloaded, copied, or used anywhere in the known universe without written permission from Fade to Black or the Game Changer Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Follow me on Twitter at JChurchRadio. Everybody be safe. Go Backley Tappy. Tappy.